So, all right, we'll get bloody started because I know you're a busy bloke. You don't have too much time. Um, so, Tim Edwards, long-time listener, first-time guest, eh? Yeah, mate. I've been, uh, my, my boy's got me into this and then um, it's our regular listen when we drive up to the lake. We've got our boat up on Lake Eild and then when we drive up there, it's perfect. It's not quite long enough for an episode, so you've got to do the last hour on the way home, but uh, she's sort of an hour and a half from home. So, yeah, no, we, we listen to them all. I get weird about guys like you that actually have a... Um, very good job and uh well respected listening to my nonsense so so <laughs> over 50s aren't meant to listen to this show are they is, nah, is just it, guys is like it? you they just they got a lot of respect in the industry you know they yeah. carry a bit of weight i'm like i don't know if i'm that guy <laughs> the reality is you know i've got two young boys they're 16 and 19 you know they're into they don't touch anything with a ball you know if it hasn't got a motor yeah they're not really interested snow skiing i suppose is the exception but they need a motor and the chairlift to get them up to the top of the hill but you know they love their motocross they um you know they've grown up around motorsport you know harry when he was three years old was in the pit lane at indianapolis you know kissing the bricks and stuff so you know they know motorsport they love it and obviously they started listening to this and uh and they got the family hooked that's awesome yeah no it's definitely cool the boys are they're super cool boys as well so oh, yeah, are look. you guys are you guys going to be at the oz x again this year yeah yeah no, we'll yeah, be there yeah awesome yeah, yeah can't wait um so yeah you you're a dude that has done a lot so I feel like we don't even have enough time to sort of go through everything that you've done. But basically, uh, right now you're the Ford Performance Racing, um, well, no, it's, it's not it's Ford, t- it's uh, Tickford Racing, Tickford Racing yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, team boss. Yeah. But you've worked in Formula One. Um, you've done basically everything that you can do in motorsports. It seems. Yeah, sort of 32 year veteran of global motorsport. I suppose is a good way of putting it. But uh, you know, I actually did an apprenticeship as a mechanic in a yeah. Ford dealer in Melbourne in the in the early 80s and um and then 88 yep got got the opportunity to go to europe you know quite a bizarre way it all came about i mean i grew up around motor race and dad raced bathurst yeah. and phillip island you know really before, Your dad before i was born yeah, yeah okay. you know he, he finished second in the uh, armstrong 500 back wow. in the day and um so you know i'd grown up being a spectator of motorsport never yeah. actually worked in it professionally and then it was just one of those Chance things, things happen. Yeah. Well, no, it's a bizarre story, really. I, mean, well, I suppose I'm going to tell it. it. Yeah. I mean, um, I had a mate who was actually over in the UK, and he'd only been over there about three months, and he just rang me one day, a bit homesick. Yeah. Um, and just one of those off the cuff comments you make, if you hear of a job going, give us a shout. That was the Wednesday. He rang me back on the Thursday and said, "We've got a job going here." Doco, who was an Australian bloke who'd been over there thirty years, he said, "I'm going to put Doco on the phone." And my job interview was, I hear you coming over, old son. I'll see you when you get here. And within a week, I was living in the UK. I don't, when I think about it now, I think, how the hell did I resign my job, pack up a house I was renting, put all my stuff on a boat or plane or whatever I did back then to send my tools. And next thing, I'm living in the UK. And, um, and within three weeks, I was working at Le Mans 24 hour. So it's, wow. it's bizarre that, you know, how your life can change yeah. just for that that one coffee comment yeah. and 30 years later one comment and a super open mind yeah yeah i mean look i was i was receptive to it my parents were living in queensland so i was only in a rented house it was actually my, a, a really good mate dono who who pushed me into it i came home that night and said you're not going to believe this fucking phone call i've just had explained it to him and he said we're going to the travel agent and he dragged me down to the travel agent and he said this guy needs the first flight to the uk and i flew what was the flight back then? Uh, it was Garuda. So it was via Indonesia and via... Really? We're not quite talking the 70s here. I know I'm 52, but it wasn't quite... You know, I went over to the UK when I was seven years wasn't old. wasn't dual prop planes where no, you're wearing no, goggles no. and... No, and Amelia Earhart <laughs> wasn't flying either. T- Tintin flew you over there. No. But, um, yeah, and literally I was there and it's... um, Yeah, when I actually think about it now, you think how your life can change with yeah. just a, a one-off comment like that. And yeah, and that really, that was the start of a, a long journey. You know, I did world sports cars, um, worked for Japan, I worked for Mazda, worked for Porsche. And then that was sort of 88, 89, 90, all three years doing Le Mans 24 hour and world sports car championship and driving trucks around Europe. I mean, I got my truck license in Australia just because I thought it'd yeah, you know, be handy. Yeah, it'd be handy. And two weeks after I landed in the UK, I'm driving a truck with three other trucks, which was the Mazda Speed um, Le Mans team. Yeah. And I'm driving a, a truck 
over a ferry, Portsmouth La Havre, overnight through France on the wrong side of the road. Never driven a truck apart from getting my just to do my license. Test, yeah. yeah, and 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 literally there I am driving in France um, to Le Mans twenty four hour, and then yeah. I'm working at Le Mans twenty four hours. And four weeks prior to that, I was spinning spanners at a Ford dealership in Melbourne. It's a crazy story. Eh? I mm. feel similar with the, how my whole America thing happened. Like I just had an idea to chase it. And then I would just like literally was just hunting people down like anyone I knew. And then it was the same thing. I felt like I just had a bit of an idea and then it happened and you're there. And then it was like six or six, seven years later. And it's just like, wow. Oh, well, I mean, I, I never thought it would last that long. I actually remember telling my mum, I'll be home in six months time. Yeah. It was actually 17 years Wow, before I actually, I mean, long. I came home every year for yeah, the F1 yeah, races and yeah. stuff. And But it was 17 years till I actually moved back to Australia and, brought my wife Trudy brought two sons that were one and four years old back and um you know and I'd become a Formula One team manager during that period and it's crazy to think too like that you leave a boy and come back a man yeah absolutely and with and with with a family and so much experience and oh and and stories that are living with me forever you know all those years of Formula One um you know, for a, for a long period there, Trudy was working in Formula One as well. That's how we actually met. So, yeah, right. Um, yeah, how did you guys meet? Um, well, Trudy, well, we, we met because she was working in the hospitality field in Formula One. Yeah. So her first year when she was involved, which was 94, in fact, her first ever race in Formula One, believe it or not, she's studying hospitality in the UK and got the opportunity to to work in hospitality in Formula One. Yeah. And her first ever race was Imola... 94 when Ayrton died when Ratzenberger died wow when I was running Barrichello's car and he actually had the biggest accident of the weekend on the Friday it was just the most ill-fated weekend what was it weekend. about that weekend that like was there something with the track was there something with the cars was it oh, it was a whole host of things I mean even even the start line there was an accident on the start of the race where JJ Leto stalled yeah. hit from a car from behind the wheel off the car flew over the fence and killed a policeman in the crowd after the race restarted, after Ayton's accident, there was a, a wheel came off a, par, a car in the pit lane and broke the back of a Ferrari mechanic. It was wow. just, you just when, when you think about it, how you could have a weekend where so many things went wrong, and they haven't substantially changed the track since then. It was just it's one, just a freak it was weekend. one fateful weekend. I mean, the, the cars have changed a lot. That was the catalyst for a huge amount of change okay, in, yeah. in, in Formula One, but... To, uh, you know to go so long without deaths and, and severe injury and then just to have in fact three fatalities three in, in, the, in the weekend that is bizarre yeah i've been at a racetrack well i was where there when andrew mcfarlane passed away um i was actually there filming him that weekend mm. and god it's a it's a very eerie eerie feeling when something like that so it, you just feel like something descends over the the entire event right like the atmosphere changes it's just everything's a kind of really it's, weird feeling it's it's weird when i think back now about that weekend but i mean just thinking about trudy that was her first ever weekend in the sport and almost her last she's like i'm never going back well, that's exactly what she thought yeah. on the sunday night she's at bologna airport and it's full of all the formula one teams and there's just just somber. hundreds 200 oh, every, grown men just crying everywhere yeah. just could because it was actually when we got to the airport where we found out that that Ayrton had, had, had passed, passed away. Yeah. yeah and um uh, and and bizarrely Trudy was actually talking to Ayrton just before the start of the race wow it's actually it, is this a story that you don't it, like yeah yeah this this is a story she doesn't like and yeah. it's actually it's there's a slightly humorous side to it but um it's um yeah, well, I always like telling it. She hates me telling it, but I do like telling it. So Trudy was working on the Goodyear motorhome, yeah. and and Ayrton came in a couple of hours before the start of the race to sit because he was spooked by the weekend. It was because he was the sort of the older statesman of the Brazilian drivers. You know, yeah. when Rubens had his accident, he'd gone charging into the medical centre, and and he was really spooked by the weekend. And there's been a lot of stuff written about that, but um, he actually came in a couple of hours before the race wanting to talk to the, the head of Goodyear because I don't know whether to settle his mind or whatever Yeah. and um, and he was actually in a meeting so Trudy started making small talk with him and first of all she asked his name and he said Ed and she said so what do you do and she said well I'm a Formula One driver. I'm the best driver ever. Yeah, yeah. well he didn't quite say that he was <laughs> he was very humble and yeah. um, and because Trudy then asked him well are you any good <laughs> and he said well I've qualified on pole today and she said oh is, is that good <laughs> 
And he said, That well, is amazing. At, at the front. So I joked for many years that poor old Ayrton was driving around shaking his head thinking, who was that ditzy girl I was talking to before the start of the race and wasn't actually focusing. That was it. That was the yeah. reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that, that is a crazy way to have your first ever race. Like oh. I would be like, yeah, cool. I uh, don't think I'm into this. Yeah. Well, it was actually the... I, I didn't actually meet Trudy till um, March the following year, which was the first um, F1 race of the season because she moved from working for Goodyear and actually started working on the Jordan um, motorhome. Do you so, think you would have been there 17 years if you hadn't met Trudy? Um, potentially longer because ultimately at the end of the 2004, when we, when, we, when we came home, it was Trudy's decision. Yeah, you know? okay. It, it was great throughout the... Because um, it makes a big difference having somebody there like uh, in your corner when you're away from home like that well, well you got to remember when you're in formula one you're away for two months at a time you know yeah. literally there's periods where i go racing testing racing testing i mean you know they've got it easy these days you know they don't do much testing and even if they do they have test teams i mean back then yeah. we were literally because jordan was always a relatively small team um you know we would literally be away for a couple of months at a time that wasn't an issue when trudy was traveling as well so you know we might race in sao paulo one weekend and then We'd go to stay in Rio for a week in between races and then Buenos Aires the, the following yeah. week. So, you know, oh, you mean you want me to spend a week away in Rio, you know, all expenses paid Bugger. between races yeah. or, or go back to the UK? So, you know, pre kids, you know, we, we, we were loving ourselves. Yeah. It was just a great life. We're traveling the world. But, it, you know, it's a very, you know, if you're not in the situation we're in, you know, you just see so many marriages fail because you just can't be away for a couple yeah. of months at a time. Yeah. Um, and then we obviously, uh, Harry was born in, in 2000 and Ben in 2003. Clearly at that point, Trudy stopped traveling. Mm. Um, and, and I was, it was becoming hard for me because I didn't have kids to not want to be part of their life. And you, know, you see mm. that now with the way I am with my boys. I just love being part yeah. of their life. And so it was during 2004, Trudy actually said, you know, I think we should go and live in Australia. You've got to get out of motorsport. Yeah. And you know we thought about it for a bit and then i came back and yeah it's Worked very off. successful in getting out of motorsport yeah, yeah. No, yeah i it. did i did i managed it for three and a half months and um uh, you know I, I, I flew down here between the japanese and i think brazilian races or something and met up with ron walker and some people with the commonwealth games yeah and actually um they set me up with a, a job for 2005 as the uh, as a special advisor because that was all in the build-up to the 2006 yeah. commonwealth yeah, games yeah and, I mean, always people ask me, "Well, what's a special advisor?" And I always joke, "Well, it's when but, they haven't really got a yeah. job, they just make up a job." But I seriously had a job when I arrived there. But um, yeah, and so we came back to Australia at the end of two thousand and four, and the the boys were, were Jesus, one and four ish, yeah. something like that. And um, and I'd had a very brief spell working for the Commonwealth Games, but it was three and a half months, and then involved in. Did you enjoy the change, or like you were just pining to get back to the motorsport well, stuff? Uh, it was very different. Yeah. I mean, what I first, what really made it hard for me was you're basically a civil servant. So you need a pencil. You have to get it signed in triplicate and you uh, know, a very different environment where I'd come from team manager of Formula One team, you know, managing, you know, a couple hundred staff, you know, multi, multi, multi-million dollar budget, making yeah. decisions on my own to all of a sudden I'm just in a huge hierarchy of, of a government department. Um, so it was a big change and also the, you know, I wasn't involved in motorsport yeah. all of a sudden because it was 12 months out from the com games they had test events for all of the disciplines and so i'm you know there's i'm involved in the commonwealth shooting federation championships and the lawn bowl championships yeah. and i'm i'm i became kind of a bit of a fix-it man involved in everything so you know we had the that we had a, a bowling green that had too much uh, grass zone in it by the local greenskeeper and so then i'm trying to negotiate and apparently there's a, a speed they have to roll yeah they so call I it the stimp um would it was it they call it the stimp oh, i can't remember that's the it was, that's it, the golf terminology for yeah. the green speed yeah anyway Not golf it had been over so so we had that we had the local council we had the actual club itself we had the vic sport and rec the Com commonwealth games nobody wanted to pay you know the whole green had to be lifted and, and no and way no, but it, so you're, you're all, it's all sudden, just yeah. finger pointing and yeah, like, finger we're not pointing. doing that yep yep and so you had that going on and then the the, the shooting commonwealth shooting federation championships that was uh, that was a real opener because there's all the there's small bore there's clay target long bore and you had 380 athletes coming in from all over the world all the commonwealth countries you know from bangladesh and sri lanka 
and trying to get Department of Defence, the Vic Police, all these different government departments, because essentially they're all rocking up at the airport you know, <laughs> with <Yeah>. guns. <laughs> then trying to figure out well, what are they all going to do with their guns. And so you've got everybody in a room and everyone's got an opinion and the police have got an opinion. Uh. And bizarrely, we ended up with the solution was they would take the guns off them when they landed, put them in a Chubb security gar- van, take them to the hotel, hand the guns back to them, and then they just drove around for the two weeks I here with them sitting on the back side of the car before they departed. But at least they didn't leave the airport with the, with the guns. Yeah, and like, yeah, that does sound yeah. exactly like yeah. just bureaucracy. Like, really, that's what that is, right? Uh, yeah, 100%. But getting back to your question, was I pining motorsport? I probably didn't think I was, but truly knew I was because yeah. then when I had the phone call from uh, David Richards, who's the chairman of ProDrive, who yep. actually owned this team back in the day. I mean, I knew David from Formula One and, you know, when you get a phone call and someone says, we need to have breakfast tomorrow, Tim, um, yeah, you kind of you know, know where yeah. you, you kind of know where that's going. And I went home and said to Trudy, yeah, I'm meeting David Richards for breakfast tomorrow morning and it took her about a nanosecond and her exact response was, thank fuck, you've been a miserable bastard for the last three <laughs> months. so good. <laughs> so, um... And so, look, you know, I spent a month deliberating and him trying to convince me, you know, to Just run to the push business. That price up, yeah, you know. yeah, well, yeah, a bit of that. But <laughs> it was, you know, the the team was, you know, they'd had a very troubled birth for the previous couple of years. Yeah. Anyway, so um, he, he convinced me to take it on, and uh, and I did that, and I started there March ish two thousand and five. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we've been through an ownership change, etc. But you know, it's. It's very different to Formula One. You know, you have 15 yeah. races a year. I fly in on a Thursday, you know, I'm on my way to the track now. It's, you know, you fly home generally Sunday night. You know, it's small snippets away. And I've always actually maintained that's actually quite healthy for a relationship because I, I, I see that. a lot of people that are just home 365 days of the year. They, you just take people for granted. Yeah. You know, and even my own son. So, you know, I go away for a long weekend and, you know, generally during the week, you know, get a bit of a grunt, a bit of a conversation, yeah. go away for a few days. And even now I still get, you know, fist pump and, you know, they're, they're glad to see you back after being away for three or four days. So yeah. it's, um, yeah, and yeah, literally whatever it is, 15, 16 years now I've been running this business and um, and just love my supercars. Yeah, no, it's definitely like, it's such a cool series. I wish I, every year at the start of the season, I'm like, I mean, this is the year I'm going to like really kind of get in and watch it. Obviously Maddie and Ainsley, like, we're around it so much and yeah. obviously you know being friends with a few of the boys but i just i've never really fully got around to doing it but i'll be there tomorrow like i i do love the sport and it is such a cool unique sport and it's cool that australia like when you were growing up it was would have been you know the it wasn't called v8 supercars back then but it's still that same sort of touring car they never really went away from that and it seems like it's been such a so culturally um, important to Australia that that particular championship. Yeah, and and I think you know because I've been on the board and the commission you know for the last fifteen years, so heavily involved with actually the direction of the sport and and it, you know I think one of its strengths has been through that period is that you know we've never lost the theatre. You know you just yeah. got to keep bringing it to the fact yeah we're a sport but we're in show business. We're yep. here to entertain people. Yep. You know, you hear people banging on about we need electrification and we need V6s and we need this, that and the other. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Yeah. But the reality is people come and they people watch us on television because well, they're loud, they're rough. You know, Gold Coast, you know, they go belting down that back straight at 180 k's an hour, hitting curbs that if you hit in your road car to just tear the suspension out, yeah. you know, and they're up on two wheels and bang, but, you know, rocking from side to side. They're entertaining to watch. And, and, that's, what, and they, that's what people love about the sport. And you just got to keep bringing it back to the fact we are in show business. People want to be entertained. They don't want to be sold, uh, you know, or, or a lot of them don't want to be sold electrification or, you know, you saw the pain Formula One went through when they, yeah, when they when stopped they there. To the you know, and even still today, I think people have become more accustomed to it, but it's still bizarre when you go to the AGP and the, the Formula One cars come on and you can sit next to somebody in the grandstand and just have a conversation through the whole thing. Whereas, you know, prior to their current, you know, hybrid era, you know, it was headphones on, earbuds in, you know, and and you still hear it a couple of times a weekend now because they still got the two seater, mm. which is the old Bernardi yep. um, Formula One car. Yeah. Um, and you know, and everybody, Everyone's every to the time, yeah, every time that thing goes round, you know, with some punters in the back of it, everybody's ah oh, 
remember when the Formula One cars yeah. sounded like that. So I think you've got to be a little bit careful. You don't Dilute worry the product too. Yeah, much. worry too much about you know well what might the manufacturers think or what yeah. well you know the, the, you can get swayed really. And the thing too that like that I'm into with the V8s, I care more about the people. Like I want to follow Chaz. Yeah. I want to follow J Dub. I want to see what cams, like the, you know, the different things that people are getting into and like what played out at Bathurst, like we're watching a drama unfold. It's this live drama and it, it always, it always seems like it's, um, it's clean. Like you don't really get a lot of the same sort of controversy with, you know, the footy players and there's guys getting done for drugs and guys getting done for this. Mm. And it seems like there's still a lot of, innocence in the sport in a way but then the characters that are in it they're tough dudes they want to win they're competitive but it's uh it, you know it is like a really cool drama that unfolds but it's very clean it still feels like it's like wholesome in a way it hasn't lost that yeah it's an interesting one because it's actually a challenge for the sport building those characters up because unlike a ball sport where you're seeing the bloke's face while he's in the heat of battle yeah that's true you know seriously you know while they're actually in those cars they they could be anybody it could be yeah. you or me sitting in those cars so you'd notice uh, if it was me yeah and you'd probably notice <laughs> if it was me as well but it, it's actually always been a challenge for the sport and i think probably social media has helped that actually come out because now you can actually follow them away from when they're in the car because if you like yeah. J-Dub, well, you can follow him, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if he's active on social media, you actually get to understand the individual and you yep. get to see him jet skiing or backflipping or, or you know, or... Crashing um, his mountain bike. Or, or, you know, Cam might be racing a speedway car. You actually get to follow him a lot more rather yep. than relying on conventional media, which inevitably wouldn't follow or you wouldn't capture much of that. Um, so I think that's probably helped because seriously, you know, 10 years ago, everybody's sitting there scratching their head. How do we actually turn these athletes into, you know, household names? And, you know, you've always had a few exceptions. Because we kind of had that, like, yeah, you had it with like the top dudes, like the, the top 1% of the field. But now I feel like the whole way through, like, obviously we're sponsored by Boost. Yeah. And it's like, they do such a good job promoting their guys. Like every team does do a good job. And I think... The other thing that's important as well with this with the social media side of it is you used to just get a narrative from the media and if you get one dude that's like a dickhead journalist and he's got it in for one guy because he snobbed him for an interview then that can go in the paper or like that dude's viewpoint can go in the paper on a certain set of events or if a crash happens and then they only interview one driver they get that viewpoint but nowadays with social media like guys can tell their full side of the story unedited un you know unsolicited un, unfiltered and they can get their own message across which i think is uh it keeps like almost like the media accountable as well which is kind of cool yeah and, and and it's interesting yeah you know you have some some athletes that actually somebody else manages their social media but you know like lando norris i mean my boy's follow oh, him dude, and they the love best. Lando Norris yeah 100% I don't, I'd follow up and they're always raving about oh did you see that post from Lando and yeah I'm like you know that's clearly him as an individual that's obviously got a knack for it yep. and he just knows what, what what and he'll be a mega star yeah look at Ricardo yeah. perfect example some of the stuff Ricardo puts up I'm like dude film it just a tiny bit better but he just doesn't care but, but, that that makes it so awesome and you know it's real but here's a dude that could afford to have people following him around 24 7 and polishing up his content but he's like nah just me just post whatever and like you really feel like you get to know that person right yeah and the great thing is generally it's almost unrelated to what they're actually doing you know the, yeah you know the formula one drive you know that he that he's that he's got the opportunity to do it's just it's his life outside of formula one yeah. and i think so i think that's been a great thing you know from getting the helmets off that all of a sudden you know in our category we've got 24 drivers and if they're active in social media then they will have a following people yeah. understand them and you know they they get to know the individuals a lot more than than the previous era where you literally had you know you had your brocky and your your johnson and they became yeah. household names but who else raced with them yeah it kind of yeah, you've got that you, you've got that half a dozen at the front and then the rest of you know tell yeah. me who they were no, yeah. nobody knows so and has that made the industry as a whole better do you think like have you actually seen it 
change for the better in those regards because at the same time that we're saying that like it is the best time to follow a driver but it's also probably the hardest time to get sponsors because of social media like the way that you can market and the way that e-commerce works now it's like nah man we're just putting thousands into facebook ads and instagram ads like we don't need a sticker on a car anymore yeah so it's like it's such a crazy double-edged sword right uh, it is i mean it's never been harder with sponsorship but you know there's there's a few answers to all those questions i mean a positive is you know we're absolutely you know for years we've struggled to sort of break into that 18 to 24 year old demographic yeah and we're now starting to see a shift. And I think it's social media that, you know, we, we could sit in a boardroom 10 years ago going, what are we going to do? You know, how do we yeah. how do we break into that, that demographic? And I think the social media is doing that for us now because we're actually on the platforms that people want to use. And even if we try and drive the content of that, it, that's not going to tick the box. Mm. It's all those drivers and all those individuals actually creating themselves um that's that's made a big shift there you know in terms of stickers on cars i mean you know there's very few sponsors now that that's their number one you know a decade ago or, you know or more you know you would sponsor a race team because it's about brand awareness it's and you want your sticker on the yeah. car. it's a billboard you know for some of our sponsors they're literally the sticker on the car is almost the least important yeah. thing in the whole program it's all the experiential stuff they can do yeah um that are all the money can't buy things because if they're just looking for a billboard you know there's so many ways they can find a billboard exactly, yeah. so it's all the other things that it's not the case for all you know there are some partners that is still very important for brand awareness to, to have that billboard but it's um even those ones that 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 it's that's key to them they're still you know the the other 40 things in our offering mm. is what they're they're, yeah. they're delving into you know yeah they have a technician of the year award and that technician might come to Bathurst and be, be ingrained and be part of the team. Well, yeah. that is a money you can't buy. You're literally going to work at Bathurst with the team, sleep with the team, eat with the team. You know, and if you're... Do you guys a, do that? Oh, 100%. Who's that through? Oh, we've got a couple of different of our partners that, that oh, we do it with. Unreal. Yeah, Bayford's a local Ford dealership that support us. They do that. So Bayford's is a huge um, Melbourne um, dealer group and their technician of the year gets to come to Bathurst and, and be part of the team. NZ um, have just done a similar thing um, at Bathurst as well. Because yeah, right. that is seriously money can't buy. No, you know? that's if you've, amazing. If you've sat around for a decade or, you know, or, or you know, grew up sitting watching Bathurst with your granddad or, or whatever to actually then yeah, go and work there. Yeah, thinking about that. Yeah, and, and so it's fantastic. And, you know, and it, you know we've, we've done that. And you imagine the kids that came with us in oh. 2013 and 14 when we won Bathurst. They went and worked at Bathurst and won Bathurst. You know, Monday they were back at back at work, you know, spinning King banners in a dealership. King of the smoker room. Oh. King of the smoker yeah, room. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, it's, it's those kind of experiences. Yeah. And, you know for a sponsor that's looking for staff incentives because that can be a great motivation for, for getting involved in sponsorship as well. I mean, what better way to motivate all your technicians that that's something that, you know, if they really excel, they, they could they could earn themselves. How much are you like, because my experience, obviously working with race teams in the US, like we work, I work with factory teams over there for a bunch of years. And it was always interesting, like the, the JDR Motorsports team, which I went over to work with, the the owner of that team was my best friend and business partner in the film business. So I felt like I really got to see a very detailed look at that whole, um, I guess like that debate between like, how much do we focus on this and the sponsors and the production stuff that you do and the extra, you know, you'd have a media team, you've got people doing photos on the weekend, you've got content deliverables that you're trying to smash out. And you're sort of the guy that has to make the call of like, how much do we really put into this? And it's like, how much is the pro the um, priority going to be on winning races? And then how much on this? And how do these two complement or take away from each other? Because it's got to be a kind of a hard balance these days, right? Uh, it does. But ultimately, you know, we have to service our sponsors. It's always far easier to retain a sponsor than to find a new one. That's yeah. And so point. you've got to over deliver so that when you have that that conversation at the end of 12 months or two years uh, about renewal it's a no-brainer no you've got all the data sitting there for them you know you, you've delivered on all these things um and, 
and a lot of them there really want to push it onto us. And so, you know, we've got our own internal videographer, we've got yeah. our own internal graphic designer, we've got two internal account managers. You know, Trudy looks after all our um, corporate hospitality and membership. So we've got a team of nine in our corporate department. And when I started in this gig in 2005, there was two slash three. Yeah. And so you, that's just evolved over the years. But, you, you know, that that's the expectation from the sponsors that you're yeah. going to deliver. And, you know, the video content, you know, you know to, to bring that in-house, that's just, ex- you know, we always contracted a lot of that out. But yeah. to have somebody working in-house, the amount of content we can produce now is just fantastic. And so that's a massive tick of the box for, you know, for all of our corporate partners. So whilst... You'd like to think that you're just going to focus on, right, we're going to chuck all our money into making the car go fast. The reality is you've got to get that money to make the car go fast. So you just have mm. to service the, the sponsors. And so you've just got to allow for the fact that, you know, our commercial team budgets, you know, well in excess of half a million dollars a year. That's insane. Just, yeah. So it's... Uh, it makes so but, much but sense But you just though, have to. Right? You, yeah. you, you, you've got to do it. And, um, uh, and some of the content you produce and the way you're able to service the sponsors, you know you're making the decision easy for them yeah. at, at the point of renewal not a, you know they just they're going to enjoy their journey a lot more you know invariably you've got marketing executives that are reporting to CEOs <coughs> or they're reporting to boards yeah. you know they've got to be able to you know, you know just because they might have a passion for motorsport doesn't mean they're just yep tick a box bang we're away yeah. everybody's got someone to answer to these days and so it always gets passed up the food chain but you can pass it up and you've got all that data to to substantiate why you're making the decision and and you know makes it very easy for everybody yeah you've just kind of got to be undeniable right Mm. yeah yeah i mean you can't like you know we have independent analysis done on it as well so Uh, it's not just our you know we have repicon and people like that actually so we can actually quantify exactly what we're doing because everything's about data these days you know you you can't you can't bullshit anybody you know you can't just say oh yeah we did all these posts and you got you know a huge amount of traffic yeah everybody needs to say show me the data yeah yeah it is it is crazy Did, did you think when you were running that jordan formula one team that you'd have a, over a half million dollar budget for videos and corporate in in Australia in you know fifteen years later. Yeah, no, because <laughs> to, to me, you know, Ian Phillips was the sort of commercial director of Jordan, and uh, and he is the most old school guy, and and he's totally old school when it comes to acquiring sponsors. It's all about taking them out, getting them pissed. You know, lots of expensive <laughs> red wine, cigars. I won't wine say the rest of the stuff. Dine. Yep, all that stuff, and that's how you did the sponsorship deals back in the day. It's um, you know, it, that's it's just a different era. Yeah, you know? and so I, I mean, and even the fifteen years that I've I've spent um, in this sport, I've seen a massive shift over that period. So it's um, it's just it's just the way of the world. It's just yeah. the way it's gone, and, and you know, if you don't if you don't you know, do the job that we're doing, and not all the teams do it to the level we do it yeah. but you know we're quite fortunate that we've had some massive partners like Castrol that have been with us forever and so it's um you know and they haven't just been with us for for such a long time because they like us it's because yeah. we're delivering for them year it's in results. and year out yeah that's right and it's not just about results on track yeah clearly your on track results are important but you know if you just won every race but didn't actually deliver on all the other things it would be hard to for them to justify the renewal because it's just not about the winning on race on race day. Yeah, no, definitely. Did do you think with how much everything's changed, you like you've been thirty years in motorsport. Do you think you got the Formula One in its heyday? Would you say like did you get oh. to see the best? Of, like what is the best Formula One era? Because you're right. Like nowadays, man. Like I fucking love Formula One, and I just like it is the pinnacle of motor racing like you cannot it's undeniable in that sense but it's like is it really that good as a fan to watch these days you know there's two different answers to that question there's one is actually the sport of formula one and you know for for most people that are listening to this what they see on television for me you know i enjoyed my time in formula one and the the how technical the cars were and you know you were just you know it's the it's the pinnacle of motorsport, yeah. Um, but it's a very different Formula One um, today 
compared to what it was back in my day. I'm sounding like a really old prick now, but it's just a different, you know, the stories I could tell you about the parties and, the, you know, yeah. we just had so much fun. You know, it was just, it, it was a lifestyle um, and I'd say it's more of a job now. You yeah. know, so when I left in uh, end of 2004, I promoted, um, the guy promoted to be the team manager. He's still the team manager there today because... Uh, which team? So... so so just before I left, I knew the Russians were coming. So Eddie sold the team. So I was there at Jordan from beginning of 91 to the end of 2004, which was really the whole period of Jordan Grand Prix. Yeah. He sold it to the Russians and it became Midland F1. They owned it for a bit, got sick of it, sold it to the Dutch. It became Spiker F1. They did it for a bit, got sick of it, sold it to the Indians. It became Force India. They did uh, it for a bit, got sick of it. Last year they sold it to the Canadians and now it's Racing Point. They're still in the same factory, and the guy I promoted to replace me is still the team manager wow. in the same factory, in the same office, 15 years later. He's seen some shit, though. Yeah, he's seen some shit, and he's worked for, yeah. He's, yeah, you imagine all those different nationalities he's worked for. Because that's a, there's an interesting process. Um, I'd like, actually be interested to hear it firsthand because I've done some reading on it, but how the draw works. Like, you can't just have a Formula One team. It's, like, country-based, and there's only what, two licenses per country or something like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's to be honest... It's a really weird, complicated it, it, system, right? It is, it is. It's, it's you know, it's... It, but it's changed a lot over the last few years as well. You know, you think all those old-school teams are all starting to disappear, you know? And McLaren's one of the last, you know, old schools in Ferrari, obviously, but, you know, you're even seeing Williams now. Williams, yeah. So, you know, there's been a bit of a, a change and then all the change of the, of the people, but it is a different sport. Getting back to the question you asked me before, that... You know, it was a very social sport back in the day, you know, and I talked earlier about how, you know, we'd go to Rio and have a week yeah. there. Now they're all regimented. They all fly home straight after a race. They're almost like they don't even work at the factory. They literally are just flying crews that 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 fly to a race, do what they've got to do, fly home, sit at home for, for a period, fly to the next race. You know, they literally, it's, it's a very different world, whereas, um, and, and it's, you know, and, and I talked to, to about about this with Andy, the guy I promote, you know yeah, talked about yeah. earlier, the team manager, and he says, you know, it's just a different, you know, the, the fun we used to have and the shenanigans we the get same. up to, it's just not the same now. It's just a very, and it's the way the world's gone. You know, yeah. everybody's politically correct, and you know, you just got to be. Well, I think the cameras uh, everywhere thing kind of fucked it. Yeah, too. everyone's yeah. got a phone that can record yeah. dumb shit. Yeah, but I mean, you know. When I was team manager, I carried a police certified breathalyzer as a deterrent because seriously, you know, you, you, <laughs> everyone was pissed. Everyone was, you know, <laughs> starting at the top, you know, like yeah. <laughs> bloody, it was just, it was just, you know, and and and, and to be, fair, it was even worse in the nineties. You know, in the nineties, you know, we, we would we would race at Estoril as the last European race of the year, and then we would race at Japan and Adelaide, and that last European race. They always had a celebration on the Sunday night, and it was in Estoril. And, that we and used, Euros know how to party. Oh, yeah. For sure, Euros yeah. know how to but party. But we, we would go to this nightclub under a lighthouse at a little fishing village called Cascades. Fuck. All the drivers there, and we'd, we'd always do a test straight after, on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, after it, before. It was just like a regimented thing. Every year you did it, then, you f then everyone went back to England, packed up, went to Japan, went to Australia for Adelaide. But that, that Sunday night, you would see every driver spastic. <laughs> I remember seeing Senna being carried round by this large lady because he was just so pissed. It That's was just awesome. it was just out of control. And look, that just would not happen. No. Nah. Would not happen. Nobody tested on the Monday, even though the track was booked. Everyone's just, you know, you'd turn up at the track. And, and it, was it was just, just cool. There's like just like people just sleeping complete. everywhere. And, you know, I remember falling asleep on the roof of... I needed to find somewhere to sleep. So I took all the tie blankets up, put them on the roof of the truck, made a bed up there and just went to sleep on the roof of the truck. You just, it, you know, it, it was just... That's the way it was back then. Could you imagine if Toto Wolf did that today? No. It well, would be huge news. Yeah. Oh, I reckon Tato probably knows how to drink. <laughs> Japan was always great as well because we, you stay at the Suzuka Circuit Hotel and they've got all these log cabins. So there's a bar and it's just surrounded by what appear to be garden sheds. Yeah. You know, probably actually about the same size of this, as this room. And they're all karaoke huts. So yeah, all the, right. you know, like the Schumachers would have one booked out and Jordan would have one booked out. The FIA would have one booked out. And literally, you would just cram, you know, we would cram 40, 50 people in there and just karaoke, sing, spastic on, a, on the Sunday night 
after the race. How, how many Aussies were over there at that time? Uh, there's quite a few. There's always been a lot of Aussies in, yeah. in Formula One. I think it's because they're always great workers because they don't have anybody to go home to. Yeah, so you've yeah, made yeah. the commitment to go over there. Yeah. You know, you're all involved in Formula One. You haven't got a wife and kids at home. You just you just party on. So yeah, work, been, work hard, party harder. That's right. And so there was always, you know, and we, you know, on average, we would have six or seven Aussies working at Jordan yeah. you know, every year. That's awesome. So. And like, I, I don't know if it was the same for you, but when I went to the States, it just didn't matter like what club I went to, what bar I went to, what after party, like nothing mat. I would rock up at the front door, whether I had a ticket or not, and they were like, Aussie, get in here. And because there's just, you have a, such a reputation yeah, for yeah. partying, you know. I, I wonder if it was the same yeah, thing. Yeah, no, back d- then. no, definitely. Yeah, you, you, Aussies are always. You, you just know, got a half a foot in the door no matter what, yeah, where, correct. where you go. Yeah. I mean, generally, when you're with Formula One anyway, you've got already got half a foot in the door. And then when you're an Aussie, you've got both feet in the door before you even get to the door. So, yeah. But yeah, you know, when I, when I think back now on what we got up to and the places we got up to, you know, in, in Sao Paulo and Rio and places like that that are so fucking dangerous. Yeah. And the areas that we'd be in, you just think about it now and you think, fuck, we're lucky we didn't get killed. Yeah. Seriously, you know. And we've had, um, we had guns pulled on us, particularly in Sao Paulo. You know, you go to a nightclub and somebody would be disputing the bill because they just inflate it and take the piss out of you and you know oh, you try and have yeah. an argument and you know pretty quickly there's there's a there's a pistol sitting at someone's head so um, no shit you guys literally saw that in, in oh, bars and stuff well i mean sao paulo was the worst i mean i'd have to coach the team no jewelry no watches no nothing yeah and, I, and if you're driving back to the hotel at night from the circuit in which is pretty regular in formula one you know you're going home at midnight or one in the morning yeah um you did not stop at any traffic lights yeah you just slow down navigate it and then boot it and go through because so many every year it happens they do a good job of, of sort of keeping it quiet but it's it's just always been like that you just yeah. you do not stop at traffic lights and anyone who does they get that tap tap at the window and you look and there's someone there with a gun and you know what they want everything you've got everything yeah Yeah. that's a it's crazy like with the the gym that i go to is like a heavy brazilian gym and you some of the stuff you're like what the fuck is going on here with these dudes but then you think about it like they're all hardcore like they're from brazil all of the boys are from brazil they've only been here a few years and they're just fucking wild men because they've come from a wild place and it's so hard to I mean, have the context of it if it's just on the Gold Coast you're like bro it's a fucking Gold Coast yeah. but they're wild dudes man because that's a wild country it's a, it's a beautiful place seriously beautiful and they're place. beautiful people too yeah it is but it's a hard environment that they grow up in and you know the people that have got money you know and I don't know what the percentage is but it's you know that one or two percent at the top they don't even go on the roads they all fly helicopters you know you drive into the track in the morning and the, the skies are full of helicopters because they all fly from their fancy houses to their office blocks they don't want to go down on the roads with uh, you know risk of uh, of being robbed so you know it, there's such a haves and have nots there yeah but such a beautiful place you know and you know to was that one of your favorite countries then that you went to do you think uh, uh, to be honest i always enjoyed going to montreal Canada was Canada, just, yeah. yeah, Montreal was just a fantastic city. It just, and it was the way, it always fell in the middle of the season. And so, you know, and it's on the St. Lawrence Seaway, so just great food and great restaurants. And then um, guy who owns Cirque du Soleil, every year he'd put, you know, if he's got a new show coming out, he'd actually debut it because he's such a uh, Formula One nut, absolute yeah, yeah. Formula One tragic. If he had a new show coming out, he would actually set the circus tents up and, and that would be the first showing of the show and all the, drivers and team owners and team managers we'd all get to go to the Cirque du Soleil shows um and so but it's it just a beautiful city Montreal and then there was always the added advantage as well because they could never ever get everybody on the flights direct out of Montreal back to the UK so they always look for people to go back via New York so unfortunately every year I had to go to New York for you know three or four days on the way home um to, to bugger it was hard it was terrible <laughs> and and um and and then you just got to drink pitches of long island iced tea it's just, yeah, yeah, it just has to be done yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Like a, did you live through like the private jet era then with the Formula One stuff yeah, as well? Yeah, yeah. So I used to go on Eddie's jet occasionally. I mean, Eddie, Eddie was a crack up. Literally. He as, was an Irish dude, wasn't Irish, he? Irish, yeah. yeah. Absolute Mad fucking bastards. lunatic Irish man. I mean, <laughs> I had the so opportunity good. to go and work for other Formula One teams, but I just enjoyed working for Eddie so Fuck, much. that's cool, man. He's just a fucking lunatic. He had, I mean... He was so very close to the music industry. I mean, he's a drummer himself and plays in bands. Yeah, but right. But very close to the music industry. And, like, his mate Chris Rea was rehearsing for a new European tour. So he just said, yeah, set up in the back of the factory. So we had to listen for a whole week of, of Chris Rea's band rehearsing. And then on the Friday night, they put on a concert for us and all free piss, um, you know, in our workshop. Um, and... You know, I remember, I don't, you know, being around Formula One, you're seeing stars all the time. Yeah, yeah. But one time I can really remember being a bit starstruck is I'm on the pit wall with Eddie and next thing this bloke sort of pushes in between the pair of us to sort of join the conversation and it was fucking Bono. No I'm shit. Like, it's pretty fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, that is awesome, eh? So, it, you know, he was a great guy to work for and, and that's why, you know, I did the Just 14. never left. Just, just never left and enjoyed the whole time and, yeah. Fuck, man, it's so cool because so many people are, like, on this constant climb. And it's like, I'm going to start at this team, then I'm going to go to that team, then I'm going to go to this team. And it's like this one-up thing, and it's this constant... Like, some people, that's just their mentality. It, even if the place is good that they're at, there's this thing that sort of pushes people to, to keep climbing. And sometimes, there, I mean, a lot of times, there would have been people that have left these great environments just for the, just for the climb. And it's like, I think it's cool when you can realize what you have in a place and, and say like, you know what, this is, this is a lifestyle. This is, I'm happy. Like you sort of choose your own happiness over yeah. what other people could perceive as the right move for you. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I was fortunate. I mean, I, I you know, I, I did the staircase, but I was fortunate I was able to do it in the, in the team company, that I was yeah. in. Yeah. And, and that just came down to the fact that I was passionate about what I did and, you know, I really cared and I, and I pushed hard, but, you know, I was, you know, started as a, as a mechanic there and then made it to, um, you know, and then you move up the staircase of mechanics and then, you know, obviously I was number one on, on Barrichello's car and then, uh, you know, by the mid nineties, I was sort of chief mechanic for the race team, you know, and I was, Jesus, I was, you know, 25, 26, and I had 35, 40 year old blokes That's reporting insane. to me. But you know, obviously, I, I'd, I'd, I'd earned it, and um, and then you know, I was test team manager, and then ultimately became the team manager, um, and in fact, even took on more than the team manager because we sort of we got to about 260 staff, and then hit tough times in sort of early 2000s and had to sort of scale back to about 200 and at that point we lost the managing director and so I inherited half of his jobs as well and and so but you know obviously Eddie thought I was capable and and you know um, the, just, rest is, the rest, the rest is, history, is history yeah. as they say uh, yeah. is he still around uh, he still does commentary yeah, he's, yeah he still right. does commentary but you know he made so much money out of Formula 1 really oh yeah, I mean, he, fuck! Isn't he, the old saying if you want to make a big fortune in motorsport, start uh, if you want to make a small fortune motocross uh, motorsport, motorsport, start with a big one. Yeah, he he did it the other way around. He started with not a lot. I mean, seriously, because he did like Formula Three and shit. Yeah, right? he did Formula and Three. Like, and of, in fact, I almost ended up working for. I mean, I worked for Doco for a couple of years, um, and I almost after one year ended up working for Eddie, which would have been the beginning of '89, doing um, Formula Three thousands because our two factories were opposite each other, but. Eddie and Doco had a bit of a falling out, poaching staff, and anyway, uh. so I ended up staying at Doco's. <laughs> but he, um, in '91, seriously, him and Marie in Phoenix was making sandwiches for the team, you know. And you think about what they grew into. Yeah, they literally. I mean, he's a he's a merchant banker by trade, but he had a passion for motorsport. Um, and he literally in those, so he just killed it through sponsors in, in those early years he literally camped out on sponsors doorsteps he actually thought he was going into Formula 1 with Camel because Camel sponsored his Formula 3000 team oh, yeah. um, and then it, it, through various things he, it didn't work out but he literally camped out and managed to get the seven up sponsorship, and so we had that. I mean, most beautiful F one car ever. That that the green 90, and the blue. The, that ninety one Jordan with the seven up sponsorship was just a ripper of a car. But you know, so you think where he started from there, and I mean, the team was tiny that first year in Formula One. You know, the, I'm probably exaggerating if I say there was forty staff in the team. And yeah, bear in really. mind, we designed. You know, three guys designed the whole car, every single part of the car. Um, 
so you know we were a tiny team when it, when it started out and then you know sort of its heyday was sort of those late 90s where we had because Benson you guys and, almost won a championship right yeah and uh 89 no sorry 99 i think it was um with frenson yeah we we're in the top three of the championship we we're winning races and um yeah, Fuck that uh, for, for a cool, tiny man. little underdog team. Yeah, but that was sort of in our heyday. You know, we had Benson and Edges as a name and right sponsor. We had Mastercard. You know, so we had some really big global brands, yeah. and you know, he was killing it. Um, but to be fair to he him, he must have been a super just charismatic, fucking cool dude. Oh, eh? fucking lunatic! That's just so lunatic. Good. You know. It, Hard to even have a conversation with him because just a fucking mad Irishman. <laughs> but you just had to love him because yeah, he's a yeah. fucking lovable mad Charisma, Irishman. Bro. Yeah, he could a not say. He'd have to put "fuck" as every third word. It literally everything was the fucking, 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 fuck. It just <laughs> constant. Every it didn't matter who he was talking to. He could be talking. So to there's that. hope for me. <laughs> oh mate, you, you don't swear. But for some reason, the Irish get away with it. You know, oh, an yeah. Irishman saying "fuck," it's actually a. It's almost like yeah. it's just an accepted part of their yeah. dialogue. And so it didn't matter who he was talking. He could be talking to the Pope and every second word or third word would be fuck. It's and so good. I love yeah. it. So he was just a great guy to work for. Yeah. It's so cool, man. Like, I just love like those stories and to know that you were there for that time and, like, from such a humble beginning too, you know. Like, yeah. just that – it is – like, Australians are famous for the Aussie battler story. And it's like, if you want to just put all of that in a nutshell, it's like, just read about Tim Edwards. Like, it's fucking so cool the, uh, yeah, what yeah. you achieved over that time and then to, like, just to keep doing it. Here. Yeah. yeah. Look, I'm a, I'm a different Tim Edwards to what I was back then, you know, in the... the, the Old the, age, you get us all, mate. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 52, <laughs> born in 67. And then you've got yeah. a couple of fucking motocross kids that I'm sure... Well, they keep me young. And my wife keeps me young as well. She's... You know, I'm fortunate she's a little bit younger than me, so she keeps me young as as well. You know, you're as old as the woman you feel, as they say. <laughs> so, but yeah, look, I mean, yeah, you know, you think some of the Aussies that were worked with along the way, as well, even sponsored. I mean, we were sponsored by Paul Stoddard. Speaking of Aussies that are, you know, charismatic lunatics, he was another lunatic, yeah. a very different type of lunatic to to Eddie. But you know, he he was sponsoring us in the. I'm going to say late 90s with his European aviation business. We had our own corporate jet. It was a 50-seater plane that he flew us to all the races on. Um, was, that, it, was that a well-behaved affair? Oh, fuck Every no. time you got Oh, on. my God. <laughs> Mate, I, that, that, this could be a whole gypsy tale. I was just talking about flying on, on Stoddy's plane. <laughs> well, if I give you... It began with a, with a 50-seater private jet. And literally, you know, you would get on at Coventry Airport, a small little domestic airport, um, in, um, and we only use this for the European races, uh, you know, at, on a Wednesday morning, and literally you'd get on the plane and they would give you massive wine glasses full of red wine. There was no restrictions about smoking. Literally, Stoddy would be, as we taxied out, Stoddy would still have the door open, having a smoke, and he, was just, <laughs> he would casually lean in the doorway, having a smoke, and you'd get near the end of the runway and he'd give it the old flick out the door, pull the door closed, Get on the loudspeaker and say <laughs> we're about to ha take off. Either hang on or sit down. That that was sort of the. It was uh, just a a wild wild ride with, with Stoddy. I want to um, watch this movie. Like, mate, how do we watch uh, this movie? Geez. There were some scary times on his planes, which oh, I, won't, I, I, won't, I won't talk about. But literally, they were just they were just. He actually ended up buying five seven four sevens off British Airways because then he he, he snagged uh because he, he was mainly doing all those small um you know like he'd fly footy teams around Europe and things yeah, like those yeah. European aviation jets. But then he bought the five seven four sevens that had full you know British Airways interiors in them, and he actually made a lot of money out of that. Um, three of them he actually used. Um, he was doing a lot of charter flights for holidays. A lot of people go down to the Caribbean from the UK, yeah, so he did yeah. charter flights with that. And then at one point, he he used them for what's that big the um, where where all the Muslims all congregate? You know, where millions oh, like of Jerusalem. Yeah, you know, once a year they all go there for the the Mecca. Yeah, yeah, for Mecca. So he had one flying out of Malaysia, one flying out of Africa, and one flying out of somewhere else, and he just earned a fortune. Really. But, but seriously, you that's have to put a in, weird ways to make money, isn't but it? To, oh, I, speaking of weird ways, I'll get, I'll get to that. <laughs> he was a. It cost him a lot of money as well, though. Yeah. The plane coming out of Africa, they lit campfires on it. They would squat on seats and take a shit. Just they just they didn't know anything about flying planes, so just 
you know, he, he would rock up and just say, oh, fuck, you know, tell you the story about what had happened to one of the planes. But when he bought those 747s, that was great. He'd actually moved on, and I think at that point he'd, he'd bought Minardi, to, so he was actually running his own race team. Um, but we still, you know, would catch a lift on his planes when we could. And the 747s we used for all the long-haul flights, so it would be yeah. Minardi, Jordan, and, and Sauber. We'd all go to Bournemouth Airport, which is a tiny little domestic airport in the UK. He would literally have to get the tug to push the thing all the way back at as far them. back as it could go yeah that's right <laughs> to get the thing to take off and then he actually the first time they did it they blew all the fences down because yeah. oh because of the jet out yeah, the back yeah yeah, yeah yeah anyway i think they got the move the fences moved um Bought but next we would, cattle station we'd then fly direct to indianapolis race in indianapolis for a week then we actually rather than we go straight to japan because we had a two-week break we just fly to hawaii direct to hawaii to do the race there um oh, sorry fly to Hawaii, have a week there, then go to Japan, do the race there, fly home. But, you know, on his planes, it was just absolute party town. That's you would so literally... Sick. I mean, I remember taking off from Osaka Airport and it was like on a Monday night. We all went down the back cabin, pushed all the seats forward and just made this one enormous... It actually creates a big flat space. We all sat in a massive circle, massive Cuban cigars, <laughs> red wine, as the plane's taking off watching the people oil surfing because oil surfing was an absolute tradition on all Stoddy's planes so we started it in the in the in the mid 90s on his small planes and what oil surfing <laughs> is is you get those safety cards the plastic yeah, safety yeah, cards yeah. one under your ass one under your feet five people in a line right behind the cockpit you hold on to the first seat where the first person does and then as the plane lifts at the end of the runway you let go and you hammer it down the, the, the aisle of the plane. I mean, we won in Magna Corps one year and, and Murray Walker used to come on the plane. He was in P2 and he shot off down the plane with his catch flays. I don't know if you remember it, but he used to, and it's go, go, go. He oh, shot yeah, yeah, down yeah, the yeah. plane behind Stoddy with his dodgy hip and everything. And then we, then we moved on to doing it standing up. That was when we were getting really brave. So you would stand up, one under each feet, and then you would surf down the plane. That was fine on those small planes. Then we started doing it on the 747s. You get some momentum, man. The 747s with four cabins. So Stoddy, at, at that particular... <laughs> that, when when we take off at, at, uh, at Osaka, we're all sitting down the back on the wines, big cigars, playing lifts. We're waiting, kind of, you know, sticking your head out, but not wanting to stick it out too far. And, um, and then Stoddy appears... Having already gone through three cabins, he would have been doing, I don't know, 50 k's an yeah. hour. Unfortunately for Stoddy, the back cabin, the seats joggle in a little bit because the plane's starting to narrow yeah. a bit. He's hit the first seat in the front and he literally landed in the toilets at the back of the plane. <laughs> so, yeah, so there was there was a lot of fun times had on Stoddy's planes. So you don't think that Lewis Hamilton and Valtteri Bottas are doing that at the moment? No, nah, they're just on their little private jets. <laughs> they're on their, Actually, yeah. you asked me about that before. Eddie's private jets as well. I didn't ever really answer that question. So I used to go on his plane, which was fantastic. We'd race at Magna Corps and we'd literally finish racing at four o'clock. And I would be at, he would, he would literally, as the race finished, if we weren't on the podium, be screaming at me, let's go, let's go. And we would literally run out to the car. We'd have a car sitting there waiting. We would go to the local airport, literally pull onto the airport, be in the plane, and literally sometimes 15 minutes after the race had finished, we'd be wheels uh, up. Yeah. And then because of the time difference, I'd be home in the UK by, you know, 6 o'clock having dinner. That's insane, eh? What a time, dude. Yeah, I had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and then just come back to little old V8s. No, it's not little old V8s. I love my V8s. No, but yeah. it's just it's just a different world, different yeah, time in my different, life. Different times, eh? You know, I, I get you couldn't keep that up at, at this point too, eh? Like there's only so long that you can you can no, live that's that right. lifestyle. It's, it's not a healthy lifestyle, that's for sure. But it's a fun it, lifestyle. Yeah, it's a fun lifestyle. But you know what? I've got a fun lifestyle now. Yeah, you know, yeah. Trudy and the boys, you know, the fun we have with motorbikes and yeah. boats and jet skis and water skiing and going to Vietnam you know we're doing the, the yeah, Vietnam the tour. tour in December this so year so the boys are going to be able to ride there yeah Harry's got his licence so um, Ben's only 16 so yeah. he's going to go on the back of Harry's bike and oh, Trudy will go on the back of mine But so that he can't ride at 16 over there uh, I reckon dude we, we've, we've put it on Jason but yeah. at this stage he's sitting on the back of Harry's bike fuck that yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> just for you know him. Have a word with yeah, him. Yeah, I will actually. Yeah. Man, it's so much fun, eh? Like, yeah. I wish you were doing it when we were doing it. Yeah. Well, I went. Went. I mean, I, the reason we're doing it is because I followed you blokes doing yeah. it at the start of this year. Went to Adelaide to the first race and said, "Fucking hell, Maddie, tell me about it," because it looked fucking unbelievable. And um, and so I came home and I said to Trudy and the boys, "Should we do it?" And they're like, "Fuck yeah!" Done. And so done. So so yeah. I'm having fun times in yeah. a different way now. You know, I just have so much fun. We, you know, we try and travel a lot. We went over to Vegas in May of this year, went to the last round of Supercross at oh, Sam did Boyd. did you guys and, do that as well? Yeah, and then Monster looked after us, so we're on the platform, right? It's so, That's sick, eh? Yeah, we, you know, we're at the Vegas and we're shooting Uzis and dune buggies through the desert. Trudy's in with me and Harry and Ben are in the one in front chasing each other through the desert. So we do some cool shit and have a lot of fun. Uh, you you've sort of like I don't know whether it's famous, but like you sort of famously dip out on racing too. If the boys have their own racing and things like that to do, like you've missed a couple of events and stuff. Like, does that sort of does that go down well, or do people ever sort of question that? But that's sort of like a non negotiable for you, it seems. Uh, look, I don't do it very often. Um, I always cop a flogging from the social media yeah, yeah. warriors when I do it. But the reality is. Um, you know, if I haven't employed the right chief engineer and the right team manager run the team, then I've employed the wrong people. You yeah. know, I've got some great people doing those jobs. To be honest, at race meetings, more of my time is spent, you know, talking to sponsors and those sort of yeah. things. And I, and I really only do it. I mean, Harry and Ben love doing how to desert race. You yeah. know, mainly they do motocross, but they love the how to desert race. I need to do that and, with you guys. Oh, you? so much fun! Just yeah. you know. You know, people talk about Fink, but actually in terms of bikes, it's bigger than Fink. You know, yeah. 780 bikes, and it literally sells out in two or three minutes. Yeah. It's just crazy popular, and it is such a good event. You know, yeah. it's just – and so the boys love doing that, and Trudy loves it. You know, <laughs> you know, we're literally – as we're walking out, Trudy's already booked the hotel where we stay for, yeah, the, for next year. For next it's year. just – it's just – it's part of our life, and the boys love doing it. It's hard, but it's such a – you know, doing motocross, you're really close – doing it together as a family you know camping the night before yep. and that but doing Hadda it is when we go up you know we go up on the Tuesday the week before they spend three days pre-riding you know dialing themselves in dialing the bikes in then Friday you know I'm flat out or Thursday afternoon prepping the bikes and you know it's just you know it's a full family affair yeah. um, you know Trudy, yeah. Trudy has so much food made literally you know if you, you're looking at our pit tent for the pit stops during the race because like, you you've, you've got you've got to get yeah. the, the boys fed and there is enough food for every single competitor yeah. in our tent you know whatever they feel like you know so they very they hardly eat anything you know we might squeeze a bit of honey banana into their mouth or something yeah. but but bugger all you know they're literally we've got our pit stops down to about 15 seconds so they ain't got time to put nothing in their mouth anyway it's just what Trudy shoves up under their helmet to get in um, I've only really appreciated the whole family side of racing lately because I'm 31 now and I still go racing with my dad and my mum and my brother and my mates and it's the same thing. Mum still makes all of our food, dad does all our bikes. It's it's such a like a crazy thing to think about. Like all of my other mates like they're not doing shit with their family in their 30s yeah and it's like you know you sort of just don't have to grow up in when you race motocross and you know like you i'm sure you guys are going to do it for a really long time and then now you know we did that cape york trip we did the trip with um the vietnam motorcycles trip it's like there's just it's such a really amazing way to stay so close with your family yeah i mean i think that's one of the reasons i'm i'm so passionate about the sport because i actually do see the family side of it yeah you know you, you get a lot of people throw stones at you you know or, you know how do you let your how kids do, you do your that kids so you know dangerous. so dangerous and you know you know to be touch wood ben's not really had any motocross industries he's had broken limbs cartwheel and mountain bikes and stuff yeah. but harry's had some some serious injuries and um you know, even in the hospitals, you know, you can get a yeah. fair few dirty looks and, you know, you're back of the queue, you know, for, for inflicting that on, on your kids. But to be honest, you know, they wear all the protective gear, you know, they're not stupid the way they ride. And I think there's a lot of, a lot more positives than there are negatives because, you know, yes, it's brought us close together as a family, but they think about their diet and they're thinking yeah. about, you know, they don't, you know... If they're playing footy, you know, they, you go and play a game of footy, you know, 
we as parents would just sit on the sidelines and cheer them on for the two hours then we'd go home and they'd go to the club rooms and get spastic yeah it's just kind of that's the sort of culture, the culture. Of, yeah whereas you know we just went, we just did the Transmoto 8 hour at, at Wangaratta which was fantastic so you know Harry had his mate and his mate's old man and I was pit crew and Trudy's you know chief caterer and um, it's um, the night before you know clearly I'm, my brother was doing it with another team we're all on the beers yeah. but you know Harry was there he's 19 years old and normally he'd have a beer or, or whatever and he didn't have any because yeah. you know, he's actually thinking about I want to be in the in the best shape for tomorrow and I don't want to be suffering and and so when you think about all those positives about you know you're probably more you're giving more thought to your own health and well-being than you are yeah. I think if you are doing some of these other things clearly if you're a professional footy player or something that's, that's different yeah but you know we, we do it you know we're amateur level and we have a lot of fun and a lot of enjoyment and like this weekend we're up here in Queensland and and Harry's taking Ben riding on Saturday. You know, I, I was with them last Saturday when they were riding, but they're going to Boydie's place at Park 4. And yeah, they'll, sick. as two brothers, they'll just have a lot of fun chasing each other around. And it's just, uh, I think it's 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 great. It's great for a family. And as you say, you're 30, you're at one years old, yeah. still doing that with your family. And I'm, loving I'm, it more than ever, to be honest. Like loving it and appreciating it more than ever. Yeah. For well, sure. Yeah, well, you know, I th I'm quite happy that Harry's 19 and he's still that close to us because, you know, I'm on the board of MA and I see, you know, the participation numbers when they get to 17, 18, there's a massive drop. Mm. And then, you know, sort of 22, 23, you I know, didn't it starts know you were on to. on that board. Yeah, yeah. For my sins. And, um, but literally. All of a sudden, you, they get to 22, 23, participation numbers start coming back, and there's a big ramp up after that. And I joked about it with Harry a couple of years ago. I oh, know what's going to happen. You're going to get to that me. age. You're going to dump me. Yeah, I'm just going to be like your first girlfriend. Bang, gone. Um, and he's done a little bit of that, but he's not completely done it. Yeah. But, but I see so many of his friends that have literally, you know, sold the bikes and. And you know, it's just it's just what happens. You know, they get to that age, and there's alcohol and clubs and girlfriends yeah. and all those things, and they go and do that for two or three years. Then they think, oh fuck, it actually sucks. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. you know, I, I want my bike back. Yeah. So, and and I think you know, there's probably an element that they're tradies, and you know, as well, or they've just started work, and yeah, you, dad's now yeah. said, well, you're paying yourself now, so there's a bit of that in it as well. But it, you know, it is interesting how you know, sort of, they get to the mid twenties and their the numbers are all climbing again. Yeah, well, it was funny because I had a period of time where I was like, no, nah, I'm done with bikes, I'm done with racing, I'm sick of getting hurt, it's not worth the risk. Like Andrew died, I had a bunch of bad shit go down with you know guys that I was super close to, and then when I moved home, it really was the Transmoto events that got mm. me back on board, and I think that now, like you're right the numbers do sort of go off like i was probably in that same kind of category like obviously i moved away as well which didn't yeah. help but i think nowadays it's like you sort of you, you get sick of the, the racing for no reason essentially when you're not going to go pro and you've got a job and you've got all that sort of shit because to race motocross is just fucking hard even to do it at a dog shit level like me but it's like at the with the transmoto stuff or these and I always get shit like they're not the only events I, yeah I know but I just they're the ones I know and I, I go to but they've brought back like an appreciation of what this shit is all about and if you ask me when maybe five six years ago like oh do you think you'll let your kids ride and I'd, well, I would have said no, no 100% it's not worth it I got hurt a lot and you know there's no like even the future of it even if my kid was to be really good it's not an amazing <clears throat> career and I was very negative on it and then the the Transmoto events and then that's inspired me to do the like the Vietnam stuff and then this uh, Cape York trip that we just did my one of my goals is to do Hada so it's like I'm I'm reinvigorated because and it's it's because of the family element it's the family and the friends and it's like it's such a just a tight crew like my one of my best mates Cam Palmer I'm not sure if you've met Cam no. down the track but he comes to every event he doesn't really ride that much like he'll ride a couple of them with me but like he's there doing the bike prep every morning you get up i got up a day in the dirt to fill my bike up and lube my chain and it's already done and it's like it's just there's a, a beautiful culture around motorcycling here and all over the world if you embrace that culture hmm. and even like um i was teaching my girlfriend to ride sam's klx 110 the other day and she's never used a clutch. She's never changed gears because she drive, drives an auto. And it's like, 
I was thinking, man, I was driving cars at eight, like full blown manual cars. Dad had everything rigged up so we could drive. We had rally tracks in the bloody in the cane fields that would he'd literally let us rally around his sixty series Land Cruiser. And it's all like all of those skills that I got. I've, n- I've never been in a car accident. Touch wood. And it's like this shit I've got from racing, mm. like being there, learning those skills. Like I know how to control a motor vehicle. I understand. I even know what it's like to have a really bad accident. And I know I don't want to do that. Mm. So it's like, there's just so much good that can come from it. And that, that family element is just, it's so fucking cool that I still do that with my family. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. I mean, and, and yeah, and that's why we've we've done what we've done as a family. You know, yeah. they, the boys started out riding a Pee Wee fifty, and you know, and it just grew and grew. But I saw the positives. Yeah, you know, clearly the kids don't see that because they're just, you know, just having they're fun, just enjoying it. For but what I it think is. they get it now, and yeah. and and that's why you know they are like they are. You know, I'm, I've got two fantastic sons, and I think they've grown up. You know, they've we've met some amazing families al- along the way as well. Um, and and like the transmitter of it, we did at Wangaratta. That was our first one. And, and yeah. to be honest, it was following people on Instagram and going, "Yeah, this, this looks like a bit of fun. This this could this could be for us." And to be honest, even my boys, did, you know, Harry didn't know much about it. Um, ben didn't do it because he just came along because he's um he was, he was still junior. But even Harry didn't know much about it. Told it to his mate and kind of, and then my brother got involved and he ended up with a couple of teams of his mates. Mate, the next event. You know, we're you there. Guys are there. Oh, yeah. we're there. Yeah, that's right. You should right. come do the six hour up here with us. Yeah. Well, the the one they're looking at at the moment is I think there's a Bateman's Bay or something. I think oh, it's yeah, the twelve yeah, hour. Yeah, and yeah. Mar- we've just got to wait till the date comes out and yeah. see whether it's going to fit or not. Yeah. But same thing, you know. You know that you know my day job is all office based. You know, looking at spreadsheets, bloody you know, balancing budgets, selling sponsorships, bloody you know, all that sort of stuff. I go to the motocross track, or I go to a come some kind of a you know um, hatter or um, day in the dirt or whatever those events are, and I'm mechanic. I'm You're bloody, all I'm, back on I'm the tools. Mate, I am back on the tools, yeah. and you know, and I love it. The boys don't do anything; they're full, you know, factory. I, I, factory oh, they're full kids, factory, yeah. mate. Yeah, they're full factory kids. Got their fist glove sponsorship. Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, percent fist gloves. Yeah, <laughs> unit gear. Yeah, um, but they, um, you know, they love it, and I love it, and you know, and even Trudy, you know, I think. You know, she was a bit skeptical when we first got into. She didn't even know anything about motorbikes when, yeah. when I first bought them, and she's like freaking out. Uh, but uh, you know, she's seen the positives as well. Um, you know, now she's a full motor motocross Tourette's mum. You know, <laughs> when the boys are racing, she has motocross Tourette's. That's fucking you can't awesome. stand her near anyone else because she fucking swears so bad. When she's, <laughs> the motocross uh, it is Tourette's. motocross Tourette's. That's awesome. And baby. so you know, we all laugh about it. Everyone laughs about it, but. But, you know, she loves it as well. And she loves the fact that, you know, the boys are there doing it with us and we're doing yeah. it as a family. And, you know, we ended up buying a bloody work and play thing. So, you know, the bikes are in the back. So, yeah, you know, yeah. it's um yeah it changed a bit now. Now Harry's in senior, you know, you kind of, you know, you end up going and staying in hotels and stuff like that because you want to go to the local pub for a palmer and stuff yeah. like that. And, and, to, and we've actually raced a little bit less over the last 12 months. I think part of that is because there's just so many good tracks popped up around Melbourne with yeah, Park well, 4 are, and Ride crazy. Park and Cruzigs. Seriously, these tracks are just fantastic. And so the boys are getting their fix every single week riding at these tracks. You know, when, you, you know, when you're racing, you know, you're waiting, you know, it could be another yeah. month for the next race yeah. or whatever, and they just want to ride all the time. And so these tracks are really, you know, they're just – you know, they're riding way more than they were, but we probably haven't raced as much. Yeah. Um, Fuck, I should take my bike down for oh, Melbourne they, Supercross. They're, they're so good, the tracks, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I really want to go ride. Like, I've known Boydie for fucking 10 years. Yeah. I'd love to go ride down there. And, like, same with Crucix, like, film down there. Like, before that was – way before that was a track. Like, it was just a little quarry that they sort of dug out. Well, that's how I had a test track. We go yeah. there. There's a, there's a, there's a thumper, thumper cross track, I think they call it, which is 2.6 Ks. So, I send the boys out on that, depending oh, whether Harry's doing senior do loop or, or, or Ben on junior – uh, that's how many laps you got to do you know that's how i measure all my fuel and 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 they can work on right oh that's gonna you know 38k lap of hatter you know it's whatever it is 15 16 laps and yeah. so they go out and it's all fast flowing sand so it's it's a great place and then there's the pro track there so you know if you really want to you know, do some jumps and that there's the pro track so you've yeah, got no, a great yeah 
I keep the wheels on the ground. Yeah, okay. oh, it's, it's it's good track. But even I mean, even I've got on a bike back down. I uh, saw that recently. Re- yeah, very so, recently. Well, I I kind of you know I've, I I had t- trial bikes and you know I raced motocross when I was a kid. But yep. then when I first came back from England, I had you know a lot of different um, in, uh, trial bikes and enduro bikes. Um, but then because I was doing this with the boys, literally I had no time to go ride. And so I sold all yeah. my stuff because, you know, to be fair, I was getting as much enjoyment out of watching them ride yep. as I was myself. Then a few years ago, I bought a Harley because I thought, oh, well, you know, I'll have a little midlife crisis, buy a, Harley, buy a Harley. Yep. So I me and Trudy chug around on that. Yeah. And then I sold the Harley and then I've had no Fuck bike for a bit. you guys are going to feel like a million bucks riding through Vietnam, eh? Like it's, <laughs> it's, just, it's like a it, Harley, isn't it? Yeah, it's pre- yeah. yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Like it, yeah. and, It's and, only got 150 cc's though, so it's missing a zero you don't want anything else i'm telling you like you the first day you're on it you're like fuck i don't know that this is going to be that much fun and then it's like you know it's i call it the go-kart effect like you know when you're at the go-karts and it's slow as fuck but everybody is just on the same second and you're just like ah, just holding the thing flat and you're just like wow okay i, I get it like there was one day you guys are doing the top gear tour right yeah yeah so that's the same one that we did so you, there's one day it's called the western ho chi Minh trail and bro there's like thousands of yeah, we were laughing about this one a couple of days ago i don't know we must have seen it on somebody's or maybe they posted something yeah there's like two thousand corners and you're literally rooted at the end of the day oh man and it is the most ridiculous like if i've got some photos i'll show you after yeah. it is ridiculous the landscape it's like you you like you're racing through jurassic park there's no one on the road it's like a ba- it's a, a back road yeah. there's no one on it and then me dad and maddie so there's the three of us all the three girls are on the back and you know when you the bikes are all on the valves so they're going as fast as they can but they're all on different <laughs> different uh like syncopations mm. so then you just hear this whoa, 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 like just this rolling valve bounces of all these different bikes and we're all just like three wide through the turn oh fuck dude one of the best days ever just that that one ride you just feel like a superstar i'm looking forward to that yeah so get get you will i'll tell you after about just yeah. like the good gear and stuff to yeah to well Matt, matty gave us a few tips last yeah, weekend he's sweet. gonna send a list through and he's yeah magnetic tank bag and he's told yep, trudy yep. about some bloody little inflatable cushion to yeah, stick under her ass because yeah. it's, it's like 1800 k's or something i think so over yeah, the, over yeah, the 10 yeah, days so yeah. It's a few Ks, but oh, the boys are so excited. Yeah, they're man, really... Just, the, just like the, the cultural side of it too. Like, man, the first night we got there, I was fucking starving and it was late, so everything was closed and we're just like rolling through these street markets trying to find something to eat. I for sure ate dog. Like 100% ate yeah, dog. I've got, got a good dog story. <laughs> Have you eaten dog? Yeah, yeah Mexico City in, uh, <laughs> I don't know, early 90s. We had an F1 race there and, um, and it was the Tuesday night and we went out for for dinner and um had the dinner and i thought mm, tasted a bit odd you know didn't didn't really enjoy it but still ate it anyway had a few beers and then it was only when i was walking out of the restaurant i noticed the two dogs on spits in the window wow and seriously i could not eat for the rest of the week i just it just fucked with my head and yeah. so on, on the friday night i thought fuck i'm gonna go over mcdonald's mcdonald's tastes the same everywhere in the world yeah Except Mexico like dog. City. <laughs> I, I literally I left on the Monday or the Tuesday after the race. So you were vegan I, for a week. Yeah, uh, yeah, maybe. But I, I just <laughs> I couldn't eat. It yeah. just really, really fucked with my head. I'm sure there was nothing wrong with it. It was just a complete it's weird, mental man. head fuck. You love dogs. Like dogs are Yeah. That's not what they're there for. That's eh? right. But yeah. cultural, man. Yeah. But it it will be cool for the boys, man to see like just the how different the culture is mm. and like we went into one village which um, you guys will go through it was the first time the tour had actually gone through that village and um there were these kids that had never seen a white person like that's how far back you go like we're pretty much on the border of laos mm. and you're riding through that was a day too where there was just like buffalo everywhere so it was a real like one lane windy road potholes everywhere and uh just buffalo and you'd have to literally like I'm riding and I've got like one hand on the clutch and this fucking buffalo is just standing in the road to where I can't get past and I'm like pushing a buffalo in the face <laughs> to, to move it. Like that's how that's how raw it is. Like yeah. it's just it's not like a holiday. It's a, it's an adventure holiday. Yeah. Like it, yeah. So yeah, you, and, that, that, I mean, that's, and that's what we're looking for. You know, we've done so many holidays with the boys and taken them all over the world, but really haven't done any 
um, of that part of Asia. So it's going to be a, an eye opener for them to to really experience that. The um, one of the Formula One races that is on my radar to go to is Monaco. Obviously, yeah. Is that definitely one of those ones? It's that's a good place to worth propose. Going to propose, yeah, right? Tip of the day. Good is place it, to propose because that's is where, that I where that went down. Yeah. yeah. My sister's never forgiven me because my brother-in-law actually was working for Benetton, and. Um, I proposed to Trudy. It must have been on the Sunday, Sunday night. And we'd had a load of um, uh, vodka jellies because yeah. Trudy was fanatical about me. We were sponsored by Kremlinovsky of Vodka, so we had a shitload of vodka. Shit sponsor. So we used to make up those big plastic bags, you know, that make the ice cubes in of, yeah. of um, vodka jelly. So we'd had a shitload, and um, and I thought it'd be a good idea to propose, so I did. And then we went down. Did you have the ring and everything? Like you did nah, it? shit, no. <laughs> nah. Uh, how many years? 22 years ago. So kind of made a right choice yeah, yeah, yeah. But we'd only known each other for six weeks so i wasn't messing wow, about really yeah so it was it was monaco 2005 and i only met her at march 2005 anyway so my brother-in-law worked for benetton and we all went to the rascas bar which you know the second last corner at monaco is called rascas yeah and there's yeah. a bar on the inside of that corner ah. so we went there on sunday night broke the news to my brother-in-law that i'd proposed to trudy he went and bought two bottles of champagne I don't know how much they fucking cost, but my sister has never forgiven me. Because bearing in mind, a beer in Monaco, if you go to the wrong place, can be 140, 150 bucks wow. for one beer. Wow. So these fucking bottles of champagne would have been fucking thousands. And he went off and bought two bottles of champagne, and she's never forgiven me. Did, he should probably because she wasn't there. He should have just gone and bought a ring in Monaco. Like that's probably a pretty good spot to buy a ring, right? I feel like there'd be some cool shit around there. Yeah, good on you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just put you make sure it. you take your partner to Monaco with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Tip yeah, of the yeah, day. yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah. That sounds good. Rascas, the it's a good the, the bar, eh? Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, yeah, that's a place. That so I, Monaco, it's a, it's a great, it's yeah. very different. Um, but it's a, it's a fantastic place to to go to. Yeah. I mean, you just walk around with your jaw on the deck. You yeah. Know, the, literally the, the the yachts and the the money is just fucking ridiculous because that's like quintessential formula one right like yeah. it's just over the top everything's just luxury to the nines of celebrities the the circuit is still the same I mean, like, if they if they decided today that they're going to have a race in this place called monaco the fia would rock up and say mm, you are never going to have a race at this track yeah because you know just the infrastructure and the the, the run you know it's just it just wouldn't meet, yeah. You know the modern criteria for any new city that's looking for a race, but yeah. it's been there forever, and it's it's grandfathered in. Yeah, that's it's right. That unlimited data plan of Formula yeah. One, but yeah, just the just just the the money is just yeah, it's it's mind blowing. You yeah. know, you, you have to just walk around staring at the boats. Yeah, you know, and they're all just billionaires on all these boats. It's it's um. Yeah, it makes it makes you feel pretty poor. Well, we um one of my best friends got married in Italy, so we stayed on the Amalfi Coast for a week. Oh yeah, and we had we had this like old pirate ship style yacht. It was the coolest thing ever, and we were just like, look at all these other yachts, you know, like we've got the cool. It was like a, that a, is a big sailboat. That. that was our last European holiday. So the oh, au- really? August August two thousand and four, um, you know, three or four months, whatever it is, before we came back to Australia, that we we shot off for a, a weekend. Just the two of us down to um, down to Amalfi and stayed on the cliff at, at right above uh, Amalfi. Ah, oh, beautiful it's part insane, of the world. Eh? Beautiful part. But how's the traffic there? Like the that road, like to, they buses and they go through the tunnels where they've just had to like blast out these holes in the yeah. rocks. You're just like, how the fuck does this? Uh, like this shouldn't function the way that it does. But eh? the whole of Europe's like that. Yeah, you that's know, true. And that, and that's what. You, you don't realise how young Australia is until you go to Europe. Yeah. I mean, we got married in a church that was 1500s, the fucking wow. church. And you kind of, and you think, fuck me, we, you know, Australia wasn't even, th- you know. It wasn't <laughs> even a thing. It wasn't even a thing, yeah. I'm sure for the Aborigines it was a yeah. thing, but for, but for the rest of us, it wasn't even a thing. Yeah, and that's- so, you know, the whole of Europe is just so fucking old compared yeah. to Australia. And that's, you know, it's... That you get like a feeling when you're there too. Like you can you can actually feel it. Like I was talking to one of my mates about it because he's he's kind of funnily uh, saying how he's just like done with travel. Like he's just not one of those dudes mm. that's super into it. But he's also been everywhere, and he's he's like, oh, I didn't really like Rome. And I'm like, you're standing on like fucking six thousand year old cobblestones. Yeah. That they still just, drive on. Like that's right. Just think about where you're standing again and, and some bloke stood here in fucking Roman gear and probably slayed someone or something. Yeah. 
just to just to do that yeah. and like the that big parliament building like that big white it's just all white marble it looks like a wedding cake but it's a fucking massive building mm. it's like how was this a real place eh? yeah oh it just i mean it's, it's just very very different to australia I mean, we've got friends who live in switzerland and that is just the most beautiful yes. beautiful place yeah. you know in summer in winter it's just a magnificent place. In fact, Harry went over and stayed with them in February this year, and oh, went yeah. and um, and went s- and uh, the most insane skiing. Yeah, and their their son is just this freak on skis. He does all that Red Bull oh, shit yeah. where they just you know free scam where they just jump off some cliff and you know they film it from the other side of the valley. Yeah, as they go down, Harry went and they literally they that some days they would climb for two or three hours for a 10 minute ski and then they got to climb out afterwards but the photos he, he oh. shared with us like fucking unbelievable I mean I wouldn't even contemplate skiing down it, but just you know it's just the most beautiful part of the world Switzerland yeah Seriously. I remember when I flew into Geneva like you fly over the Swiss Swiss Alps and like the French Alps mm. and you're just like are you serious? Like, how is this place real? Well, I mean, like, where they live is you know, sort of the Verbier <coughs> sort of ski area. And, you, I mean, you would need the whole of a bloody winter to try and ski all the runs there. It is yeah. so fucking big. It's, um, but just, just beautiful. You know, and the restaurants, you know, the, you know, that's all part of the culture. So you, yeah. you go skiing for the day and then, you know, it's not like you go to a restaurant at the top of the mountain and just have a, you know, a hot dog or fries yeah. or something that you might have, you know, here at Australia at a cafeteria kind of thing. Literally, like James Blunt owns this pizza restaurant up there and it's just fucking amazing restaurant. Yeah, yeah really, really good. That's I, think he, that. I think his partner's, a, it's Carl Fogarty and and James Blunt, bizarre really? couple, yeah. own, a, own this restaurant above Verbier. That, yeah, with, that's crazy. With cowskins on every... That's the one with the cowskins, isn't it? Yeah. Cowskins everywhere and just the most amazing pizzas and wine and... That's yeah. like... There was a pub that I went to in um, in Glasgow or Edinburgh and the, it was like the oldest pub in Scotland and like they just... They'd never... I can't remember how old that would have been but it was hundreds and hundreds of year old yeah. and like the bar was still original. The seats... Like we were in a booth seat like obviously they've got some tables and chairs which obviously they're not from that long ago mm. but yeah all of the booths and stuff were just like the original timber the original varnish it was just we didn't even no idea just walked in wanted a feed and i ended up i had a lamb shanks pie that's still to this day one of the best meals i've ever had in my life lamb shank pie geez. yeah uh, uh, that's right i mean uh, and you know you like me you know we're fortunate that we've seen so much of the world yeah. and you know and that's what we've tried to actually do with our boys as well because i just want them to see so much of the world and you know you still come back to australia and you appreciate what's here yeah. you know and, and you actually probably you know ha- having seen how a lot of the rest of the world live you know you actually appreciate how good australia is yeah. you know it is you know for all its flaws and our political correctness etc it's still a fucking amazing country to live in oh for you know sure. and, and unless you've actually been and seen you know what it's like in rio for most of the population and things like that you don't actually realize just mm. how good this place is do you reckon your boys got like they uh like better for those experiences like do you think that they really do understand because i always think that about when i have kids like, i do want them to see like you know w- w- we went to costa rica that was the first time i saw like essentially a third world country and houses with barbed wire fence all around it and guys sweeping there their driveways with homemade brooms and you know they were super beautiful happy people but that was the first time where i was like fuck there really is poor people in the world well i mean to, to be honest most of our holidays uh, you know we haven't seen that sort of thing yeah but harry went for a month uh, 18 months ago with with school he went to guatemala and belize and for two of the weeks of that month they literally built houses for, fuck, for the cool. for the for the people and literally, that he was just full on labouring, absolutely rooted he was. But you know, when he would tell you the stories about how there's just rubbish everywhere and there's just shit everywhere, yeah. and the only way they could have a wash, there was a stream that wasn't even a foot deep, but all the food scraps were on the on the floor of the creek. But you had no choice, so you're literally lying, wow. lying in this, you know, less than a foot of water, trying to, because you're just sweating your ring off as well. Because you imagine what Belize and Guatemala yeah. are like, um, so. I think that was a fantastic experience for him yeah. and, and something that the school organised, but it literally 
really opened his eyes. Yeah. You know, they did some really cool shit as well. They went, I mean, and you think about what they did, you would never get away with it in, yeah. in, in you know, in, in Australia or somebody like that. But they went caving down caves where they're literally for kilometres underground, lying on their back. You could hardly even get through. No, nah, I'm out. But he said it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. And they're, li- but they're literally going past, um, is it Mayan ruins? And there's yeah. the skeletons there and stuff like that while they're floating down these caves. Not all of it was really low like that. Yeah. So he did some amazing stuff there as well. Um, but to actually see how the majority of the population live in Guatemala, because they you know, weren't near with um, the main cities. Yeah, it's a very different world, and um, you know that, and they had to raise all the money as well, because then yeah. they had to pay tradesmen to help them as well. And so all the money they raised went to to pay these tradesmen to help them build these sort of concrete block buildings. Houses, but yeah. all the bloody they had to lug everything up. They had to mix all the concrete. They had to put every block in place and they just did it under the guidance of the the tradesmen that they'd paid so it was a life experience that is yeah you know that is a that'll sit with him forever oh 100 percent. do they get into the v8 stuff much like do they follow it at all yeah no they watch all the races but um ben's probably more uh, more into it than harry harry's more two-wheel obsessed the, yeah the, than harry um but you know for for both of them you know they've had the experience of winning Bathurst and things like that as well I mean yeah. every time you see the repeat of 13 or 14 when we win when we won Bathurst and that last lap because both of those last laps were quite famous yeah. last laps halfway through both of those laps they panned to the to the garage and there was Trudy and Lisa and the boys there in the garage I mean one of them I think it was 13 Ben is literally everybody else is like cheering and Ben is actually petrified oh. all four all all of his fingers in his mouth like so you know they've just they've grown up around it and yeah. so they can't not be into to yeah. motor racing and I, I sort of you know whatever it was two hours ago I mentioned Harry at Indianapolis I mean literally he was three years old and he'd come there yeah. on Stoddy's plane so you know I'd lose him and he'd wander it off and, you know, he'd be up in the cockpit, you know, playing with the pilots and stuff like that. But he's at Indianapolis cleaning all the Formula One wheels for, for Jordan, helping the truckies out Yeah. at three years old and going out and kissing the bricks on the, um, you yeah, know, the, the finish the line, finish line there. Yeah. there at, 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 so, you know, they're just into it because yeah, it's, it's... it's all they know, it, eh? it, Yeah, well, it's not all they know, but it's it's certainly, you know, they've grown up with yeah. it. It's just a big part of their lives. Yeah. Dude, talk about friggin' crazy Bathurst. How gnarly was this year? Oh, yeah, frustrating is probably the best way to describe it for us. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, we went there with four fast cars, you know, on, on Thursday afternoon, that last practice session where everybody banged some good tyres on, you know, our cars were third, fourth, fifth and sixth and they pretty much all did identical lap times. So we knew we had fast cars. Yeah. And when you come away with nothing, when you've got fast cars, it's it's a it's it's harder to swallow you know if you go to bathurst and you're trucking around and your car's good for 10th or 15th deep down you know you're your not really you're, you're not uh, a, you know in you're not place. really in the hunt and who knows you might snag something you know because of other people's misfortune but when you go there and you got four fast cars and you know we are in this fucking race you know yeah. we've got we've got four chances of this out of 26 cars and you come away with it with diddly squat you're pretty fucking pissed off but, yeah you know it, anyone who's been in motorsport for, for long you know you've got to move on as quick as you can yeah you know you can drive over on monday and dwell on it and be fuck but then you gotta get back into it you know yeah literally by tuesday wednesday all you're thinking about is how can we win some surfboards this weekend on the gold coast yeah. you just got to reset as quick as you can because no point dwelling on the past you know dick always used to joke no point looking over your shoulder just keep looking forward yeah you don't want to trip over something behind yeah, you know if you can learn from it you want to learn from it but make sure you learn from it quickly yeah. and then move on the whole thing with Chaz and cam like they've this is what's that the third time that Chaz has run into cam like do you just scratch your head and just go like how what the fuck Chaz? but like because you know they're friends and you know like they like each other it's not like well from my end anyway i'd say it, i look at it, i'm like they're fucking homies like how does this yeah, shit even yeah. happen well you yeah you know, everybody knows there was nothing intentional there. Yeah. It's just that dumb things happen. And and so if nobody's done anything intentionally, you know, no point yelling at anyone. Yeah. You know, they, whoever's folded in any of those incidents, you know, 
they know they've made a mistake. You know, Chaz put his hand up straight after the race at Bathurst. He said, you know, that's all he could say. Sorry, I fucked up. You know, he's acknowledged it. Is there any point me going, yeah, you're a fucking idiot, shouldn't have done yeah. that? Absolute waste of my time, waste of his time. Wouldn't change anything. You move on as quick as you can. Yeah. You know, it, he will learn from it, hopefully. You know, so you've just, that's just the way it is. You know, there's, there's no point yelling and screaming at anybody because it doesn't change anything. And, you know, if you ever thought somebody had done something intentionally, well, that would be worthy yeah. of a conversation. But accidents happen. Just got to, you know, hope, pray that they, they yeah. don't happen again. And I mean, it can be, the thing is, like, it can be anyone that's next to that car and gets, yeah. you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Chess came together when he was driving the, you know, the Forest Elbow in the BMW. Well, yeah. Cam wasn't in the other car. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, you know, just, yeah. just shit happens, you know. You know, the reality is they're race drivers and they're paid to drive as fast as they possibly can yeah. and they want to win. They, you know, they all want to win at all costs because that's what they do. And you, you don't know? want a driver that's going to tiptoe around a racetrack. No. I mean, you know, it's that fine line, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's... You know, there's there's no point having somebody that's driving at 95% because you will never succeed. Yeah. You know, the reason Jamie won all those championships is because that level of confidence underpins it. And you see that with, with Scotty Mack now at the moment. You know, they're almost able to drive at 101% yeah. because, they, because they've got that, that, that little edge of confidence. Yeah. And it's almost like money makes money and success breeds success. 100%. Momentum, and, dude. Yeah, it's that's all right. All momentum, eh? And, and in a category like supercars, it's so fucking close. You know, it, you know, the, the, you know, you, you could be 0 0.05. In fact, Chaz was, I think it was at Adelaide last year. He was 0 0.05 off pole and he was fifth. Yeah. You know, you get to a driver on the radio and say, yeah, great job. You 0 0.05. Off you the know, lead. he would think, oh, fuck, I'm second. Yeah. And you got to break the news to, no, you're fifth. You're on row three, bro. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's so fucking close. So, you know, that element of success and that little bit of confidence, if that just gives them a half a percent and then, you know, such a small amount, then all of a sudden, you know, they're qualifying at the front. And same with all motorsport, you know, the qualifying is so important. Yeah. Um, in four wheel sport, anyway. It's. Uh, you know, invariably you might go forward a couple, back a couple. But, you know, the longer races, it mixes it yeah. up a little bit. But, you know, typically qualifying is very important in, in four-wheel racing. And so... It's, and that's what Scotty Mack's doing. So oh, he's well. a master. Yeah. Has been for years. And so he's at the front. So he either gets a good start and he's able to control the, the race from the front. He's got clear air. His brakes are cooler. His engines are cooler. You know, it's bloody hard to pass. If your car is... is even on a clear lap, you know, you've got a car that's 0 0.1, 0 0.2 of a second faster. That's still well, that doesn't ain't a, guarantee that ain't a, a pass. Yeah. That's not enough to go past. You've got to yeah. be half a second or a second faster than the car in front of you to or actually pass it. Or have a mistake from the guy. Yeah, just yeah. keep pressure on and, and they have a mistake. So it's, um, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things. You've got to be able to qualify well in this category. Yeah. And, and you see it, you see it with, with Scotty at the moment. What did you make of the whole um, Scotty Fabian thing? Oh, look, I mean, you know, it was team orders. Yeah. You know, they, they're not going to shy away from that. It's, um, uh, it's just unfortunate because I think, you know, it probably robbed the Australian public of what could have been a, a, a cracker of a finish, you know, because yeah. they would have come out in sixth or seventh place. I mean, Fa uh, Gizzy was the effective leader. Lee was effective P2. Reynolds was up there. You know, they would have had shorter stops. They would have passed him. Scotty would have been sixth. Because you guys Someone. really do know this. Like, oh, we've with got the, all of the data that you guys correct. have, like, it's very easy to know exactly what would have happened barring something like no, no, it, what happened. It's on, it's on our strategy simulation stuff that's sitting in front of the engineers because we're calculating everybody else's stop time. So we know how long everyone's been in the pit lane. Everyone fills their car up. It's very rare that you don't put a full tank in um, during an enduro race. Yeah. And so you kind of know where everybody's at, you know, and. If you're sitting at home for the public, you go, well, that guy's in P10. Well, he's not. He's actually on a different fuel strategy. He's got half a tank of fuel over the, those other guys. At some point, he'll get to cash it in. When he cashes it in, he'll be in the stationary in the pits for 10 or 15 seconds, and they'll be stationary for 28 seconds. So, yeah. you know, and we've got all, you know, we don't have to sit there quickly calculating it. The software's doing it all for us. So we know where, where it's at. 
And so, yeah, that's for me, that's probably the most frustrating thing is it, it could have been... Scotty may still have won. There was so yeah. much still panned out and other safety cars that happened later in the race. But at that particular point in time, they wouldn't have been the leading two cars. Yeah, yeah. Him and Jamie would have been fifth, sixth, seventh, something like that um, with four other cars in front. So, yeah, I mean, look, uh, you know, it, it's it's... It's, yeah, a te- it's, it's a like, team game, yeah. And so you know you are working together as a team, and I don't know how that one went down, but it didn't go down. I'd suggest as they'd planned, because there was no rational reason why he went from one point seconds, one point six seconds behind his teammate to forty seven seconds when he only would have had it just been about queuing. <laughs> that's like not even. It's like double. It's like the, barely even. Like that's taking the piss at that point. right? Well, that's what I mean. It didn't go. Whatever they were, whatever <laughs> they were doing, and I, you know, I don't know what all their code was and all that. The reality is, you know, they they wouldn't have intended to do that. It, yeah. It's just through miscommunication or whatever. It's it's gone pear shaped, and all of a sudden, it's just made it look really fucking bad. Yeah. Okay. And I guess like. Your hands are obviously like I'm asking this que- these questions as like a dude that has I've got zero fucking consequence. I can say whatever I want, but like you're in a different position. But like, is that even hard to deal with? Like the you know cams and the because didn't J Dub get like a fifteen thousand dollar fine at one point just for like criticizing cams or something like that? Oh, uh, he yeah he he. Did. I mean, obviously two sides of stories, but it's like they're the governing body and then they can issue fines for people that's. Well, they're the ones that issue the penalties in supercars. You know, we don't. Um, you know, we've got so we've got um, sort of an interface with the stewards, but you know, CAMS. Uh, well, they're now Motorsport Australia. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, they are our FIA representatives in this country. You know, and they provide all the judicial services. So we give them the rule books, the supercars. You know, and I'm on the commission of supercars. We develop the rule book, all the technical and sporting rules. We give it to CAMS and the stewards and say police this for us mm. so that the, they have to make their so own independent, to be an independent third that's party. right you know it's it's not like after that race you know one of the teams has said to cams you need to do something about that you know it can be raised by a team but ultimately the 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 judge and the etc and the uh, judge you're an executioner correct is cams you know so we've got to have a level of independence there so it's not just teams throwing stones at each other yeah and so, yeah, and, and in the Jamie incident, well, both Jamie and Cam got into trouble over their comments um, uh, in New Zealand where they sort of yeah. had a crack at, the, at, the, um, at race control. And you got to remember, you know, you can understand Cam's position. Well, I can understand Cam's position because at the end of the day, a lot of the, the, Cam, the Cam's officials are volunteers. Yeah. So you've got people, you know, and I th- people who are volunteering their time getting criticised – and that's where it kind of went a but bit. But is the sport like big enough to where the people that are in charge of those kind of calls like should they should they be volunteers at this point? Well, I mean, the, the Australian Grand Prix at Melbourne is um, you know, is that the, all run by volunteers? Well, every flag marshal, yeah, all those, all those, you know, most of the people in race control oh, are, are volunteers. Yeah, 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 yeah. You'll have the FIA stewards fly in, and I don't know what the deal is with them, but I. You know, I'd suggest they're probably not paid as well. Yeah. Um, you know, everything's covered for them. All their costs yeah. are covered. So, yeah, it's it's a tricky one, you know, but I can also understand Jamie and Cam's frustration. You know, it fucking ruined their race. Yeah. So you can understand why, you know, they made the comments that they did because, you know, their day had been destroyed and nobody thinks for a second there's any malice or in, in you know, um, you know, wrong intent there. Yeah. But for whatever reason it happened um, and it wrecked their day and you know for us as a team it was a fucking disaster because I went from having four cars in the top ten all racing for a podium to three of my cars were taken out of the race the only one I was left up in the pointy end was Chaz who was on a different strategy to to the other three so um, you know as a team we were pretty pissed off about it at the time because your day's just done and you know and we're probably it makes it even worse for us because we've got different sponsors on all the cars. So you've got different commercial pressures for every uh, one of those cars. Yeah. You know, if you're a, um, like a, a Penske or a Red Bull, yeah. yeah, they've got two cars. So if one of your cars is taken, that doesn't matter. Yes. All your sponsors are still going to be yeah, happy okay. because you've delivered at least with one of your cars. Yeah, I could see where We're that's... running four silos. You know, whilst we're a team and we all work together as a team, the commercial partners for all if those Cam cars... If don't win, Monster don't win. 
That's right. And yeah. and 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 Tim Ryder from Monster won't give a shit about the fact yeah. that Jazz won in the super cheap car because yep. it's delivered nothing to, to Monster. 100%. So you know that that that's a real challenge for us. Yeah. Okay. Should do you think that guy like drivers should be able to criticize? Um, maybe you go, criticize probably. I don't know if that's the right word, but it's like should drivers be able to speak their opinion without being scared of for fines? There's a way to do it. Yeah. You know, so you, you can, think you, that's really the, it, where the it, issue it, is? It, yeah. Don't mark the man. You know. Don't 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 really attack. Yeah. Kind of on a personal basis, you can yeah. be frustrated with the situation. What they got pulled up about was the fact that they, you know, they kind of really went honed in and made it, yeah. it a bit too personal, which is why they sort of got themselves into a little bit of hot water. Yeah. But they both did the right thing. I think in the cold light of day, they thought, well, maybe I shouldn't have said it like that. Yeah. And then you know, they both apologised to the officials, and you know, it was all, it was all. Um, I think everybody walked away happy. Yeah. Okay. That's fair enough. Yeah. It's it's interesting for me because like I'm like I said I'm not one of the hardcore. I'm not watching every weekend. I I know those dudes and stuff like that so mm. you know you kind of i get one side of a story and it's interesting to sort of you know yeah. hear from somebody in your position yeah. what what did you think of the um the fine from the shell like that the shell dudes got in the end uh, well i mean at the end of the day that you know i think it could have been a lot worse you know if they'd yeah. really gone hard at them because is it like it's a like it's a team sport but is it like match fixing essentially like what they did well, I mean, think about all the people who put bat- bets on. Now, I know we're not That's linked with saying, any betting yeah. companies, but you know, the, I know people that you know there was very good odds on on Lee Holds- Holdsworth, you know, massive, odds. and and they were and they were you know threw their ticket in the bin. Yeah. So, I mean, I imagine if I was one of the betting agencies, I'd be thinking, Jesus, you know, like do we yeah, actually this. want to have betting on this sport if if that kind of thing can happen? And if you but, did that in any other sport, like literally any other sport where it's a team sport and it, like soccer or footy or AFL or whatever and like you, they literally can prove they're like going through all of the different you know radio communications and all that shit and it's like yeah you through the race forget about the radio communications just visually what it looked yeah, like I mean yeah. I was standing on the pit wall and I knew our cars were literally you know within six seconds of, of the lead so I'm standing on the pit wall and the, the two lead cars come in the pit lane where the fuck's our cars? Yeah, and I could hear a bit of carry on because I got radio, so I'm listening to all four cars. So I got oh. I got radios going off everywhere, fucking people yelling and screaming and like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and I've watched them do 20, 30 second pit stops, both Red Bull and and um, and Shell, and their cars left, fucking still not in the pit lane. And then all of a sudden, Fabs appears, and there's just this massive gaggle just a, of cars. Yeah, just a great it was just him. fucking. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And then when I watched the footage afterwards, I'm driving home on Monday, and actually, you know, I'm watching snippets and people had cut yeah. bits out. I'm watching the footage of him coming down Conrod Strait. It wasn't a good look. And that's what I mean. You know, teams have always kind of manipulated it and you know you can say to your drivers you know your teammates behind and he's much faster or yeah or you're gonna have to queue in the pit stop and they'll you know they'll drive in through that entry lane and lose a couple of seconds you know you kind of yeah you can do it a little bit subtly but that, Within, that like, was like that was like, like the spirit of the game essentially uh, right i mean technically you could probably argue that that's not right but i mean you're you're not yeah. trying to lose that i mean that was like just jumping on the brakes putting in the first gear at the top of conrod straight so instead of doing 300 k's an hour he was doing like 10 k's an hour it was just it was the most bizarre look and as i say i think you know it's probably the the real downside of forget about what all the teams think everyone will have a story about well i would have won and yeah you know, there was you know it would have changed the outcome of the race forget about what all the teams think you know the frustrating thing is that you know really I think it robbed us all of what could have been a ripper of a finish and they might still have won, yeah. but we never know. Yeah, it there's just, always an asterisk it just, forever. It just, it's not a good look. I don't think, you know, that's that's what I think it boiled down to. It just didn't look good. It's got to be, like, so disappointing for the people that put so much effort in. And, uh, like, not even just the team side because, like, shit can happen on it. Like, you have to be prepared that you go there with four cars. Like, even this weekend, you go there with four cars, you could have four fucking wrecks. Like, that's how the game works mm. on your end. But on like supercars end and on the guys that work in the broadcast and all of the like the volunteers the punters the people that pay like that is australia like that's the great race yeah and it's like all those people it's just like nah fuck what 
waste of a year. Like we're just yeah, let's just, uh, let's try again next uh, year. And that's why no team really needed to say anything about what happened because you know we'll all have our view. At the end of the day, supercars, you know, handed it over to cams, let them make their their view of of what happened because yeah it. it, it Every team will have had their opinion about how they're impacted. Yeah. So forget about that. You know, yeah. just think about the sport, and that's why supercars kind of, you know, flagged it with cams. Please investigate this for us, and um, and cams just did their job. And I'm glad they did it quickly as well. You know, they they pulled it forward. It was going to happen here this weekend at Gold Coast, but I think you know, you know, then you just start. It gets all messed up with this weekend and becomes a focal point of this weekend. Yeah, get it done. You know, they got everyone together last Saturday, got it done, got it announced. And then we can move on to this weekend and hopefully nobody talks about it. It's just, it's a bit of history. 100% people will talk about it. 100%. <laughs> Had you not asked me, I wasn't going to talk about it this weekend, but anyway. Yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting, like, because it, it's, that seems like an issue that's bigger than the sport. That's an issue that is, like, sport. That's a sporting issue. In If you know what I mean, it's not hey. just like a V8 thing. It seems, it's like you sort of really do ask some questions around what we said, the morality of, of sport and what is winning? What is winning worth? Is winning worth fucking an entire one of Australia's bit? Like imagine if someone match fixed the fucking Melbourne cup, like that's really, it's this, it's on the same level, right? Yes. Yeah, so if, as if a jockey in third, all of a sudden he's bloody yanks on the right end, whatever it's called yeah. rain yeah. and turns right and wipes out 10 horses. Yeah, it wouldn't be a good look for the Melbourne Cup, would it? Yeah, and I think so. That's what's interesting with the situation is like obviously it happened in V8s, but it's like this is a this is a big question around just the general morality of like what is the cost of winning? Yeah, and and, and that's why Cam's needed to look at it, and they, mm. and they and they they you know they did their job, is and, it, you know, and it's you know I can't remember a penalty like that. It's uh, you know two hundred fifty thousand, albeit a hundred of it. Suspended, suspended, but sentence, still, one hundred fifty thousand yeah. is a is a good penalty. Yeah, um, and then obviously some, you know, fabs getting put to the back and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, uh, you know, points wise, it makes a difference to them as well. I mean, they're fortunate; they've actually got quite a good points lead in the uh, in the teams championship. But it moved Chaz from fourth back up to third um, in front of um, fabs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's so a, look, yeah. you know. You know, it's it's a pretty severe penalty. So obviously, Cam's deemed took it was it serious, uh, yeah. took, took took it seriously because they know it's not a good look for the sport. And as you say, it's our grand final. And yeah. So you know that the, the the you know you got a couple of million people watching, going. And the crazy thing what the too, what's going on? The crazy thing too is it's like you've got your diehards that'll watch fucking Sandown or they'll watch whatever you know the races that aren't you know these that that are not Bathurst. But then you get the people that uh, like my mum that had Bathurst on all day. She don't watch any other fucking races except for that one race because it's Bathurst. And it's like, how many, maybe what, you know, nearly a million people, whatever the number is, it's like they don't watch anything else and then they put that on. They're like, what the fuck is this? Like, what is this shit? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, it was 2.5 million people were watching, which is a pretty big percentage of the Australian population. Yeah. And you're right. People don't view it as a supercar race. They view Bathurst as Bathurst. It's what you've yeah. grown up you know, I don't watch any horse racing, but I've watched the Melbourne exactly. Cup. I don't That's watch much Bathurst footy, is. but I watch the grand yep. final. It's just, you know, and Bathurst is the same thing. You always, you know, it's almost like an institutional thing, you know. Yes. It'll be, I always go to Fred's house and everybody goes there and, you know, there's 40 people rock up there. Everybody's got their little um, way that they do Bathurst and it's just a, it's a national institution. Don't ruin a national treasure. That's the moral of this story. Yep. It's. I was going to ask, like, what would be something that you think could prevent that from happening in the future but it's like i feel like this is such what it's one of those events where it's like we might not ever see something that crazy again because this was so crazy people will be like i'm not i'm just not fucking touching it uh, like we're not doing we can't go here again guys <laughs> that's right i'm sure i'm sure they'll never do it again and i'm sure everybody else who who um all the other teams competing will go well we'll make sure we don't do that yeah, as well yeah we're all on yeah. our best behaviour yeah. yeah well I mean you know it should have been a week for them to be celebrating you know I know when yeah. the two years we won in 13 and 14 it was just you know literally it was a week of celebration now I haven't spoken to Ryan but I can't imagine his week was much fun because he would have been engaging with lawyers and he's copping yeah. all the flap it was just headlines everywhere well dude Ainsley said Fabian's getting like death threats on social yeah. media and shit yeah. like it's fucking gross yeah which eh? is all wrong yeah. you know but, but the fact is it's 
you know, it's tarn- you know, yeah, they still won, which is still a, a great achievement for them. But it should have been a week that they could just sit back in there yeah. and big smile on their face, going, "Fuck, we won Bathurst," and and I can't imagine it was like that, which is unfortunate, really, because you know that it, it's tarnished it for them because you can never repeat that. You know, yeah. the, you know, I remember when we when we won um you know we all sit around at the, the house we all stay at a house just on, on the circuit there and you know it's about 40 or 50 of us all there and we're literally we had boxes and boxes of coronas and we just it holds seven coronas the Peter Brock trophy <laughs> and so we're literally just exactly top it up. it's got seven. A fantastic thermal capacity as well gets a nice little frost <laughs> on the outside and we're literally passing it around and everybody's drinking out of the Peter Brock, Brock trophy um so you know and then you, you know and then the following weekend, we all went out and had a had a big party. Yeah. So you know, at some point you've got to to tarnish that is just yeah. yeah. I mean, you want to enjoy the fruits of what you're doing. You know, you, yes, we're doing it. It's a job for everybody, and we're all do, you know. But the fact is, we're doing it because everybody who works in the team are competitive. They love their racing. Yeah. They you know they you know it's not a nine to five job. You know, you're passionate about. It. You have to be passionate about it because the hours are you know pretty antisocial. You're going away on weekends and yeah, but. It's, um, but it's those moments. It's like those that's moments you're chasing, right? That's why I fucking do this job. Yeah. What? Well, how did the Bathurst wins compare to, say, winning uh, like a Formula One race? Um. Well, I mean, it's uh, obviously uh, all different. But it's different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, I mean, it was a to win Bathurst was pretty special. You know, for the exact reasons we're talking about before, it was something you grew up watching, and yeah. you know, it's a part of Australian culture. Um, but to win a Formula One race is pretty cool. We won our first race in '97, uh, I think it is, um, and we had Damon who was driving and Ralph Schumacher, and we actually got a one-two at Spa. Yeah, right. And holy shit, that was a pretty special day. Yeah, and we drank some pretty special wine that night as well. <laughs> so it's um, yeah, I think probably the Bathurst wins were 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 better for me than that. You know, I mean, it was an amazing time in Formula One, and, and winning yeah. races is fantastic. But yeah, Bathurst, and particularly the first Bathurst, where Trudy's there, the boys are there, we all celebrated it together. Um, you know, at that point, Frosty had been driving for us for eight years, something like that. So yeah. to, to win Bathurst for the first time was a pretty, pretty special thing. Because that's kind of the thing, like when JDR, we got a podium, the, the first podium, and me and Jay, we sprinted down, we were watching in the, in the seats we sprinted down to the floor like we the same thing you know it was just such like a special thing but I, it wasn't the race that made it special it was everything that you did before oh it's like the, years the years or whatever it took to get years. there 100 percent. it's it's yeah it um yeah it's really hard to describe but that was a very very special day when we won it the first time and then to back it up and win it in 2014 as well it's like holy shit we've just done this year two and two in a row and 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 the way Chaz won that race was just outstanding. You know, they they didn't even qualify for the race because they were excluded. Because I think Chaz passed someone under red flag or something like that. So they started from the back of the grid. Always been a problem, child. It always, <laughs> always <laughs> to this day. Um, you know, um, Paul had the accident and put put it into the wall at, at turn two, and then they went down a lap, and you know, literally everything that could go wrong went wrong, but. We had a fucking fast car, and yeah. when it came to it, that's what mattered. And a lot of people actually don't give Chaz the credit um, for that last stint of the race because we knew they were tight. So literally, he was being told Jamie's going to run out of fuel, and had Chaz not been putting qualifying laps in, he was literally—I mean, he's our father sports come. Uh, he was doing mid sevens, I think it was, and that at that time was like an amazing time. You know, now we're down into the threes. Wow, with essentially the same rule book. Wow. But, it's um, but Chaz was, Chaz was actually doing quality laps, putting Jamie under pressure, so Jamie couldn't save fuel. Yeah, everybody sort of said, "Oh, well, Chaz only won because Jamie ran out of fuel." Jamie ran out of fuel because Chaz did not let off; he just kept on him, and so Jamie was then ignoring team orders because he's got Chaz coming at him at hundred miles an hour. Yeah, and uh, and eventually forced him to run out of fuel, but it was Chaz forcing him to run out run out of fuel that was not really recognised at the time. But the you know the lap times he was doing the car was all stoved in at the front from where it had been in the wall. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was a. Um, but yeah, and to do it two years in a row, and then we backed it up the following year with the championship. So you know we had a bit of a purple patch there, thirteen, yeah. fourteen, fifteen. 
it's crazy like i've spoken to Chaz about that win and it's just so insane the levels at which it means something to the all of the individuals involved like your involvement and your entire career leading up to it of formula one racing all over the world and then take being out of motorsport and then you get lured back in and then you are able to win bathurst two years in a row and then Chaz with like his dad that this was obsessed with v8s and bathurst was such like an important part of Chaz's childhood and then Chaz gets it done that like all of the storylines and then who even knows about the crew that's on the team well, that's and right. it, it's every, so many people right? everybody will have a story everybody in the team will have a story about what bathurst means to them yeah and the reality is the team is as only good as the people that work for it you know the fact is um yeah you can have some fancy cnc machines and you can have all this other stuff but the crew of people uh, that is that is your team that is yeah. the, that is what wins the race yeah the drivers are the ones that stand on the podium and, and get to spray the champagne but you know you'd be a very foolish driver if you didn't ignore the fact that it's that team of people mm. that actually are behind you there's 60 odd people working at, at tickford racing you know it's, it's a big team um and all of them play their part yeah. everybody in some way has an impact over over um, over that result of Bathurst, you know, from the person who paints the car to the person who stickers the car to, you know, the person who's the, filmed the video that's kept the sponsor happy for the last six months, everybody plays their part to get you to that point. And so everybody has that sense of achievement because they mm. all know that they've played their part. You know, yeah, you, you know, ultimately the driver's, you know, the famous person that's, you know, spraying yeah, the they're, champagne, they're, yeah. but it is a team of people that, that, that actually wins every single race yeah what with Bathurst like it seems like it's such a great it's so famous obviously for the circuit and that but like yeah you can be on the last part of the grid and over however long that race takes normally and it's like the dude on last can actually win the race like what is it about that event that is so like it just always gives you those storylines well i mean the fact is if you're in that back half of the field you always get safety cars at bathurst so and if you're in the back half of the field you will just take every single safety car because you have nothing to lose yeah okay. so so you know it's not really a strategy because you are literally going to just take every safety car and then as the day goes on you'll start cashing in those that that fuel in hand yeah you know, so okay. every time it's a safety car you know you might have only stopped five laps before but you'll come in and fill where, up where if you're in the you know the lead 10 or 15 cars you don't want to give up your track position yeah. so you're actually got to think a lot more strategically about how you win the race when you're there because when you're in the back half you're not really in a race you, you are out of the race with nothing to lose so you might as well yep bring her in so literally safety car yep bring him in bring him in yeah. so you're just doing that all day i think Chaz pitted 13 times far out yeah in 14 it just you know huge number of times but then then you get yourself you get back into the race and point. then once they've cashed it in right oh now now we're, we're in this race <laughs> then then that's when the engineer really strategically thinks how are we going to win this race yeah but up until you're in the race and by the in the race i mean in that sort of top 10 you're not in the race so mm. you've got nothing to lose bring it in put fuel in and then you just try and cash your chips in later and that's why that race always seems to deliver yeah. such insane it's a thousand k's the, the, the you know the the, the circuit's always the circuit itself yeah. is a is a seriously difficult circuit yeah. you know it is not an easy track and then as you know towards the end of the race you see a lot more accidents because people are getting tired um and so and then inevitably accidents breed exact accidents as well yeah. because you know your safety car brings everybody back together so then all of a sudden the red on mist the comes down so you know they're yeah. all they're all on it again you know they've um and so yeah that and that's why that particular race yeah really you know in a normal 200k what i call it, sprint race you know if you've qualified last you, you're done you're yeah done. you're done you got you got a couple of pit stops you know, there's no way you can strategically really get yourself into the race unless, you know, you just do something oddball in your strategy and a safety car happens to come at the right time. But, yeah. there's a, you know, there's too much luck involved to, to try and 
really think you're you're in the race. And I suppose that's then like because it's it's all of these things that compound to make it this like I guess beautiful cocktail that almost makes it like really impossible to win in a way, right? Like so much but, luck has to happen. Oh, at Bathurst, yeah. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, first of all, you got to have a fast car, and you know I talked about it earlier. You know, we went there with four fast cars. Yeah. If you haven't got a fast car, you know you really you're only going to be you're only going to be standing on the podium through other people's misfortune yeah, or through, through yeah. other things and you know you saw a little bit of that this year um so you know but then you've still got to have a bit of luck yeah you know you've you've um it's it's not a you know i stayed in a house with all the engineers and every single night you know all 10 of them are literally around the massive kitchen table throwing strategies at each other because literally you've got to have a strategy for every one of those 161 laps yeah because at any one of those points if a safety car comes on lap 85 what are you going to do yeah and it's almost like they're almost challenging themselves about okay what are you going to do and and so you've got some set rules that you work behind you know that sit behind um your sort of your your race plan um, and you, and then you you challenge each other, and that's how they operate. To really, everyone's trying to find holes in each other. That's other's. right. And then you refine it down to the point where you might have a rule like, "Well, you will not stop." You know, if you're in the top fifteen cars, you will not stop within ten laps of of of, uh, of your most recent pit stop. And you end up with all these rules that kind of underpin your your program. Mm. But the amount of effort that goes in to win, try and win that race, um, it's just incredible. You know, it's. Even the preparation of the cars, you know, everything gets changed, everything gets serviced. You know, you go to Bathurst, you know, everything on the car is lifed. You could have a life of 2,000 Ks, 5,000 yeah, Ks. Yeah. You go to Bathurst and everything's fresh on the car. It's all out. That's yeah. right. Because it's just, it's just so important. You know, yeah. it's just, it just has a different level of, 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 of importance to all the other races. That's just got to be like fun. You know, like obviously it's stre- like it'd be stressful and, and manic at times, but like, because of human beings like to solve problems and it just seems like that race presents you with so many problems like it's got to be sort of fun for those guys to like be put to that much of a test and like be forced to just solve all of these crazy problems yeah i mean it's a fun event in general you know the it's very different to every other race we drive up there so it's almost you know on tuesday you drive up from melbourne it's like the pilgrimage you get there tuesday afternoon walk the track you've got to do that every year it just kind of just reminds you about you know where you are where you are yeah. and you know and unless you've ever walked that track you cannot you, you know television just doesn't do it justice mm. you have to walk that track and go holy fuck this is so steep <laughs> it, it just television just doesn't do it if yeah. you've never done it go and do it because it's just such a special place but just then the whole build up you know the the way they do the truck parade on Wednesday and just everything about that week. You're on track on Thursday. We're not normally out till Friday. You know, the huge crowds. And mm. so the whole week challenges you, but it also you're just constantly reminded. And it, we stay at a house just on turn one there. And every morning you walk out and the way you walk out, the sun comes up. Um, you got the pit building directly in line of sight to yeah. where the sun comes up. So every morning you get up and you walk out of the driveway of that house and you're looking at the sun coming up over that pit building, you go, fuck me, we're at Bathurst. You know, you got the tower there and it just reminds you every morning. So it's such a special place. It's so cool after all these years and all the crazy shit that you've done that that is still, those feelings are still inspired within you, you know? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's me. It's maybe you why you've lasted so long doing it, it That's I right. Guess. You know, yeah. the, the, you know the, we have a fair um, attrition rate in the category because, yeah. you know, it's 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 not an easy sport you know and and you know in this day and age you know i don't know people don't want to work as hard i mean i find it amazing how difficult it is to find staff i mean when i applied for my apprenticeship as a mechanic 500 people applied for that one job wow and now i advertise and it's fucking impossible to find staff seriously you know it's it's it, it amazes me sometimes you know even for apprentice machinists and things like that you think you know we've got a machine shop with five million dollars worth of cnc machines pretty cool place to work yeah. um you know you're involved you know you're a machinist and or you want to be a machinist and you know i've advertised for apprentice machinists in the past and we literally can't find anyone and then we've had a couple actually start and then pull the pin by sending you a text and just think so it's, it's a different world yeah and so 
you know, the, the sport has a, a reasonably high churn rate. Not not many people actually change teams anymore. They tend to just come into the sport, do it for five years or ten years, and then go, you know what, I want to I want to get a real job now. Yeah, and 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 move out of the sport. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm a I'm a long term, a thirty odd years, and um, but I am passionate about it. You know, I love I love my racing, and I've you know had that brief three and a half month spell outside of yeah, the big racing hot, long service life. yeah yeah that's right when i when i left motorsport yeah. um but um yeah it's just uh, i enjoy it you yeah. know and it's fucking hard and it's stressful and i have so many nights where i just don't sleep and trudy will tell you she i get told off because it's three in the morning i'm lying there awake because i'm thinking about something i'm sending emails and i'm you know but you know, it's it's who I am, and it's just yeah. You know, but yeah, it's um. I do enjoy coming to the racetrack because that's where I actually get to forget about the fact that I'm running a business that's you know yeah. turned over X amount of money and all the stresses of generating money and you know paying sixty odd people every month. I get to a race pe- race meeting, and that's where I get to think, hey, this is why I do it. You know, yeah, get, yeah. get to watch some cars go around racing and actually in, in, enjoy that side of it. So, where do you think that the sport will go? from here like have you got any obviously on committees and stuff but like even further down the track than what the committees are planning or whatever like have you got any visions to where you think the sport's going to go do you think it's going to continue to get more popular do you think it's going to decline like where do you think it it will go or where do you think it needs to go Uh, i mean to to be honest the sport's actually very healthy and we've seen a steady increase in in viewers over the last few years which is a real positive because a lot of ball sports that are actually flatlining in terms of viewers um in terms of how, where the cars go i mean th- there's a lot of work going on in, in that in the background at the moment for what we call sort of gen three um and uh, you know we're not at a point that we need to talk about that but we are actively discussing it and and having meetings to think about what might it look like what how like why do they change the cars so much like why is well, it not so much i mean we're to be honest well we're, yeah you guys rules don't have, have, really change them that much but yeah well the, the rules don't actually change that much i mean yeah. we you know a big change for us was we in, introduced car of the future what we called it in 2013 yeah that was a big change over what we had had for the previous decade or more um, and that was a bit about making ourselves more market relevant and trying to yeah, actually... Yeah, so that's what it comes down to. Yeah, and trying to, and trying in some ways... I mean, to be fair, I think it was a fail in a lot of ways because we thought we'd be able to take some cost out of the cars and it's actually gone the other way over the last um, over the last decade, really. You know, every year we talk about reducing costs, but at best we ever do is contain the costs. Yeah. We, ne- we never reduce because everything goes up every year. You know, we've gone from a Falcon that probably cost us half a million dollars a year to build to a Mustang that's costing us $600,000 a year to build. So every one of the spares on that car is more expensive as well. So, um, you know, the, the sport's constantly challenged with, well, how do we try and at least cap the cost but ultimately we do have to reduce the costs you know the mm. you know to participate now you know you're, you're two and a half mil a year per car minimum really and you're running four of the bastards yeah and plus yeah you've got other income streams as well but it's uh you know trying to generate the sponsorship to go racing you know it's a hard task and yeah. you know every year there's a new and emerging sport got their hand out for you know for fortnight f- f- yeah, Fortnite, yeah. So you literally, um, you know, we do need to pull some costs out of the sport yeah. because the reality is, you know, the people who watch us and, you know, the casual viewers, or more than the casual viewers, I'd suggest probably 80% of the viewers of the sport don't realise actually what goes into these cars. Mm. I mean, if we just sort of argue, you know, arguably there's about 5,000 parts on the car. On our current race car, there is five parts that come off the road car. Door handles, door latch, Mirrors and the pony on the front. That's it. That you know. So the That's other the, the other four thousand nine hundred ninety five parts are bespoke parts that we've either designed and manufactured for a for the car, or we've designed and someone else has made it for us. You know, it, it literally they are seriously high engineered, complex engineering masterpieces which is great for the people who are involved. You know, the engineers are, you know, they're kids in a candy store because yeah. they're fucking, you know. Yeah. But the reality is 
when you've got a you know a lot of the people sitting in the grandstands or watching on television that have no insight to that yeah who just want to be entertained who just want to see good racing and cars yep. bouncing off curbs and all that you got to go why the fuck are we doing it and mm. i've argued for years that it's engineering masturbation because yeah. we're doing it for nobody but ourselves and so that is the key like just go more towards the road cars oh i mean we're never going to go more to it. We're never going to turn these back into road cars. Yeah. But what we've got to do is we've got to simplify them. And how how would that like how would you guys? Do oh, that? look, I mean, we chip we we chip away at it all the time. I mean, we've not we've not had another change for next year where we're going to a control damper. So rather than having an engineer dedicating his life to standing at the damper dyno with three hundred dampers lined up, what's a damper? The the shocks. Oh yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. constantly revalving and and fucking around with the dampers. Next year we're going to a control damper, so everybody gets three sets per car put them in your car they're sealed you can't fuck with them you can't do anything with them and so you know we've got to keep doing things like that that yeah. simplify them because if we've got a, 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 a um, control damper in a car or we've got something that we've engineered so the cows come home and spent hundreds of thousand dollars developing do you know do you care no not at all yeah. so we've got to actually be smart about what we do so um, you know we've got hundreds of sensors on the car that are live streaming info back to the back to the teams and yeah, then you've got the complex program lot, right? you got com- yeah and then you've got to have complex and programs and engineers analyzing all that people live. that know how to read the shit yeah and so you know do we need that mum do we just scale it back so there's all these things that are sort of being discussed and tabled and at some point you know within the next six to twelve months i think there'll be some statements about right this is what gen three is going to look like yeah we're very very early into the piece of of, of working on it but we are still chipping away at other things in the background to just try and keep things under control for the time being until we get to Gen 3, which will be 22 or something like yeah. that. Yeah, and like, what's the resistance that is you're met with? We're all fucking competitors. Yeah, so we're all racers, and we all want to win. And if you've got if you've got something that you think's a, you know, a, the black box a, secret a, weapon, secret weapon, you don't want to give up your secret weapon. Yeah, and so. Um, but at some point, it's going to be like biting your nose to spite your face. It's like, yeah, your car's fucking sick, but uh, you're racing yourself, bro, because you've and, won and, and, so much that you're the only dude that's going to be on the track. And and we, we discussed that exact point. I mean, look, 2012, we had a ripper year. Ourselves and Triple Eight won every single race for the whole year. Great year. We for were fucking guys, loving ourselves stupid. Yeah. But I know that is not good for the sport. Yeah. Absolutely. That is shit for the sport because I even know from my own opinion. You know, uh, now Mercedes don't have the dominance in F1 that they had a year or two ago. So I'm actually enjoying Formula One more 100%. now. 100%. Because all of a sudden the Red Bull's got half a chance. The Ferrari's yeah. got more than half a chance. You know, um, so. You know, you've actually got to take your team hat off and actually think about, fuck, this ain't good for the sport. Yeah. I'm having a whale of the time and my life's probably easier because I'm able to sell sponsorship easier because we're fucking rock stars, you know, we yeah. won half the races, but that ain't good for the sport. No. And so you've literally got to be a bit selfless in that situation and go, we need to make some changes. Yeah. And obviously the big change for 2013 was actually changing the car of the future. And I think in the first 10 races, we had nine different winners. Yeah. That is healthy for the sport. Yeah. Paying the ass for my commercial blokes because it just made their job a bit harder because they can't just rock but in. Like at the end of the day though, it's like, if winning is the thing that you're going to hold your sponsorship hat on, like, yep, we fucking win, pay me, then that's sort of what you want to go towards. But like we said at the start, it's like it, winning just isn't the thing that is but, going to be this sustainable, um, you know, model to like be, for sponsorship. You've got like to be in the hunt. You've got to do everything else. You've got to be in the hunt. That, that's that's what most of our sponsors expect from us. We've got to be in the hunt. And by in the hunt, I mean, you know, in the top 10 regularly, in the top five regularly, occasional wins. That's yeah. just kind of the expectation of the sponsors. you just got to be in the hunt. You know, if you're languishing in 20th regularly, that's a harder sell because yeah. you can do as many V&R, you know. Um, VIP packages and stuff. You can do as many as you like of those. Yeah you fucking still 20th. Yeah. So you've got to have an element of success. Fuck, it's hard, but and because by success, someone's got to get 20th. Yeah, they do. But, I mean, you know, we've had years where, you know, we've we've had 20ths and thirds, you know, two weeks yeah. apart. So, you know, the category is that competitive that, shit, it doesn't take much. I mean, people wrote us off last year. They said, you know, <coughs> we had a, you know, tick for the shit. You know, they've fucking lost their way. They're hopeless. 
And you know what? By our own standards, we had a fucking disaster last year. It was terrible. We actually still finished third in the championship, mm. third in the team's championship, and that was a fucking disaster of a year for us. So yeah. because we just kept ourselves there, you know, we were there or thereabouts, and and you know for the last decade, pretty much every year we've been in the top three of the team's championship. You know, we're we're regularly up there, and that's why sponsors come to us because we yeah. are regularly up there. I can't sit in their office and say we're going to be winning every race. We, you know, we're fucking unbelievable. What I can commit to is that we will be in the hunt yeah. somewhere in the hunt and a shit year for us last year still saw us finish third in the team's championship so yeah no you, yeah you are right but it, it definitely um it's hard like because it in everything though there's the haves and the have nots eh? but i guess like is the job to try and lift the results of the have nots in a way like is that you know you sort of bring the field a little bit closer and and because like you just yeah you you don't want to be like one of those top you know the bottom four teams or it's just you're consistently there yeah. every single weekend. It's tricky though because ultimately the cream rises to the yeah. top, you know, and and then you attract the better staff and yeah, um, yeah and you see so, it in yeah. everything like in That's every right. single industry. Eh? That's right. So you know, it's um it's a tricky one. But certainly you want to try and level the playing field yeah. as much as you can. And, we, and, you know, we've been thinking about that regularly as well. I mean, for this year we made a change where we we um, we just went back to single linear spring. We had what we called twin springs last year. Um, and they're very, very complicated. So is that like so, one's so, softer and one's harder? Correct, and then they yeah, get, and that's yeah. right. And then you have a floating platform in the middle and then there's preload on them and different yep. things very complicated to set up and very Whereas, very labor intensive and there was some teams that were able to do a better job i think we've always done a very good job at it in fact Chaz and adam were actually almost pioneers of everyone's run twin springs in the rear but in 2000 and sort of 14 15 we're running in the front as well which uh. wasn't actually common in the category so you know, we've always been very strong in that area but it's it's the the teams that you kind of say that are you know 20th or so probably haven't attracted the, um, the type know, of this, mind that can do that's that, right yeah. and and so um for two reasons one is it's trying to a bit of a leveler for the field but also just to reduce some of the workload in the pit lane to tr yeah. stop burning out staff we obviously we changed for this year and, I, and there's been a lot of talk about you know that caught triple eight out a bit at the start of this year you know they obviously had a very good twin spring setup and it's taken them a bit to get their their head around it you know it's one of those things you know sometimes i'm making decisions at the commission meetings that i come back and you tell my own team and and my engineers are going what the fuck did you vote for that for and i say because it's actually good for the sport yeah, and yeah. sometimes i've actually got to take my team hat off and think what's good for the sport even if it's going to piss my own engineers off yeah because man that's the thing like you look at it even on a global humanity scale it's like global warming and then it's like fuck probably should do something about it and then you get the rich oil dude going like nah and it's because it's like this short-sighted view because in times of plenty you want to stay plentiful like it makes sense that's human nature yeah but it, like it really does take people to go dude we've got to make these changes yeah and, and that's right and 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 for all the reasons i talked about before about how these are very very complex engineering beasts uh, that nobody knows we're doing yeah apart from the fact that if you've been fortunate to have a pit tour with me in the garage and i've actually pointed out po pointed out those five parts and you go holy shit i yeah. never knew unless you're actually fortunate enough to experience that you don't know so why are we doing it mm. well we're doing it because we've just engineered ourselves into a corner over a very long period and you know and and the, the way the cars have evolved is just you know people find loopholes in the rules yep. no different to formula one you know everybody's always you know the engineers are always looking for a way if they put a roadblock in there right oh, how am i going to work yeah. around that roadblock which is as and, exciting and, and as that's well how we too, go from yeah. a five hundred thousand dollar car to a six hundred thousand dollar car that's got very little road car in it you know yeah. that's you know the zb when it came along at the beginning of 2018 it stepped up the category to a whole new level you know we rocked up at adelaide in 18 and we've got our falcon that's effectively an 11 year old car because it was debuted as an fg in 2007 with huge amount of sheet metal you know roofs bonnets everything yeah. all off the actual road car and we've rocked up there and looked at their car and gone what the fuck is that that is a composite sports sedan and we had no you know we we're completely blindsided by it 
And um, but that's you know the rules that allowed it, and they couldn't get the road car parts because the thing was and coming from Germany, the and they it. and and that kind of for all the reasons that you know they needed to do it because it wasn't an Australian produced car and all that. For whatever reason, they got it all approved. They rocked up to Adelaide like that. We went fuck, and then we were told you better go and do a better job. So then we had to lobby to have composite roofs and bonnets, and you know played catch up for eighteen. And then we got our chance in nineteen with when Ford and Ford Performance come on board, and they 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 worked hard in the background, and and we debuted the Mustang this year, which you know pushed the boundaries even a little yeah, bit a more. Little I bit mean, more, yeah. fundamentally, it's not that much different to the ZB, but they pushed it as much as they could because that's that's the business we're in. Mm. Well, hey, we uh, got to wrap this one up today, but I'm one hundred percent down to make this an annual thing. Every time you're up here for the GC, um, I've loved talking to you. You're a fucking awesome dude. And cool. um, Thanks, I mate. really, really appreciate the time and uh, and the support of the show just in general as well. Yeah, cool. No worries. Thanks for having me in. Anytime, brother. Literally anytime. Cheers.